This is a special presentation from the Brighton Central School District Board of Education. Welcome everyone. Uh, we appreciate everybody's attendance this evening. Welcome to the Brighton Central School District Board of Education business meeting and budget adoption for May 12th, 2020. Uh, a reminder that the Board of Education of the Brighton Central School District in response to the continuing emergency circumstances caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and consistent with the New York State Governor's executive orders, we're conducting our scheduled public business meeting this evening, May 12th at 7 p.m. via Zoom and on our district website. The public will be offered the opportunity to offer public comment. And I'll discuss that a little bit in a second. And you can do so this evening through our Zoom. You're also welcome and encouraged to submit any comments, questions, uh, or further information that you have or requests that you have directly to us by email. And that can be sent to District Clerk Kim Lanzafame. It can be sent to Kevin McGowan or to me, Mark Kokanovich, as board president. And we will respond back to you with an answer or further information. Uh, you're also welcome to join in uh, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday afternoon at 3.30 is the weekly Facebook live town hall with Dr. McGowan that begins at 3.30 on the district Facebook page. There is a thought exchange that's posted and the link is on the website. Please feel free to uh, join that uh, thought exchange, post any question, comments that you may have about anything that we're going to discuss this evening or any other aspect of uh, district uh, or experiences that uh, families and children and students and teachers are going through right at the moment. So we encourage you to participate in any way that, uh, that you see fit. We have a slight uh, change to our normal procedure this evening because tonight we are scheduled to adopt our next budget for 2020-2021. We are going to begin shortly with an update and a proposed budget presentation by Dr. McGowan and after that presentation, we will offer the opportunity for public comment. Any question or comment we'll take at that time. And then we'll go into uh, moving to uh, approve the agenda. And then the uh, first agenda item this evening after uh, acceptance of our minutes is for the board to take action to approve that budget. So that's the procedure. We have a number of items this evening. Uh, also, I remind folks that on the district website under the Board of Education tab, if you click on meetings and agendas, you will have the full agenda and all materials for tonight's meeting. Any materials that are being updated or that are updated this evening or added to will be also added to the website. And you can find that there either later this evening, during the meeting or tomorrow. Also, if you are sort of focused on budget right at the moment because tonight's meeting is, is sort of pointed that way, obviously. Uh, there is a budget tab also that contains all budget materials going back to really our original planning sessions that began last summer into the fall, and it will include updated information from everything that we are presenting this evening. So all of that material is available and will be available on the website. So we'll talk a little bit more about budget and process and procedure and voting uh, as we go through the evening. But for right now, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. McGowan uh, to present uh, the proposed 2020 and 2021 budget. Dr. McGowan. Thanks very much, Mark. I'm going to walk through the information and just remind people, as you just did, that all the budget materials are posted on the website, including this presentation. So we're not reading every number at people, but they are all available for people to review, including all the budget materials previously. And any additional information people would like, we're happy to get to them. Uh, whether that's when they receive the budget newsletter and they have questions, or if they would uh, like to, to um, email us, call us, whatever it takes, uh, we're always happy to explain all the information and provide people with whatever they need as they uh, consider um, how they feel about the proposed budget. So I'm going to walk you through this right now and, and uh, kind of start from the beginning and tell you a little bit about the, the areas that we review in this process. Um, up on the left-hand corner of your screen, we think about our increased staffing demands, thinking about enrollment, student needs, changes in standards regulations, our labor increases uh, in terms of contractual increases, minimum wage increases, uh, changes to health insurance premiums. Uh, those are never going down, although we're still continuing to uh, be ahead of the community-rated plans and we participate in the consortium to save. Uh, it depends on the number of participants and those rates continue, of course, to climb. 
Our contribution rates continue to increase as well. For the pension systems, we do not have our own pension. We have to contribute on behalf of employees and that's by state constitution and we do that as well, but those rates go up at the same time. We still have the multi-year impact of planning for full day kindergarten and the capital project that we consider in this process. The allowable tax levy growth at 1.81%. Now that's not our cap number, but that's a multiplier. It's actually less than 2% because it is uh, this particular consumer price index or 2%, whichever is less is one of the multipliers. This was relatively small growth in that number 1.81%, which factors into our tax cap number of 3.83. Changes in mandated student services and education plans, elective demands, changes in state aids, the New York State deficit was a huge consideration we had to review, of course, a freeze in foundation aid, the pandemic assessment, and the risk of mid-year cuts due to volatility in the state budget and a never before agreed to strategy where the state will actually have the opportunity to cut us throughout the course of the year based on revenues collected. And then also the balance, uh, balancing now with our use of current resources, weathering the storm versus additional spending reductions, which we are loath to make relative to impacting program for kids. And so we had to think about all of those uh, factors as we pre prepared this proposal for you. Just a quick update on the history to this, because many of you have followed this from the beginning and understand where we started in the process. Just simply because of where we landed after last year's first budget vote, and having to accommodate the lift of debt service, so the car payment that we've talked about often for the 2017 voter approved project, we had to get that debt service payment into the budget because it didn't exist. And that's required to be paid. We don't have a choice. The voters approved that. We borrowed the money. We're building uh, spaces, remodeling spaces throughout the district. A really transformational, uh, transformational project for us. But we have to include that debt service. And last year, in our attempt to go over the cap, we weren't able to do that the way we had designed in terms of that uh, financial planning process. Uh, and that's not sour grapes, that's just the reality as your financial advisors, that's where we are now. And the result of that was going into this year, knowing that we would have to consider ways to additionally reduce spending, all of which we talked about last year in the process of uh, accommodating going into the second vote. We talked often about programs that we could borrow for one year, essentially from one area of spending, to support a program for one more year, but knowing going into this year, we'd have to make adjustments. And the prospect of still facing this significant shortfall in the state support for our school, which I will show you as well. And even at that point, even in the point where we were coming in with our initial budget saying to you, listen, we have a $2.4 million gap, we've got to close it. We will have to reduce programs. We knew at the time we had to reduce the foreign language program by half in sixth grade. We knew we had to restructure the fourth grade instrumental program. These were program reductions that we had to look at and make along the way to fill that $2.4 million gap. And then we had this you know, unforeseen crisis that everybody's experiencing everywhere in so many different ways. Well, the impact, the financial impact to us has been pretty significant as well. And we had to look at a re an additional reduction of $1.7 million to which we were able to reduce $1.3 million and at this point, we are not budgeting for the reduction in the pandemic assessment. We've closed that gap for the time being, knowing that we may need to use additional reserves through the course of the year if we are reduced by the governor and the division of budget. But this in and of itself, this second tier is a significant reduction in program as well, which we'll detail for you tonight. And then we of course have the third tier, which is the unknown, the upcoming, the evolving challenge. And these are unprecedented reductions that we would see possibly another nearly $1.7 million or more. So when the government, the governor talks about a 20% reduction in aid, he may not be talking, he hasn't clarified this about specifically foundation aid. If it was foundation, foundation aid, it'd be $1.7 million. If it's other aids as well, the reimbursable aids, it could be quite a bit more and that could happen through the course of the year. So uh, this is something that we're gonna have to be aware of as we go into this uh, budget plan. We've been asked questions at different times about a budget and what if that changes through the year? Remember, a budget that is adopted by the community, adopted by you, presented to the community, voted on by the community, is a spending plan not to exceed. So in other words, if we have to make additional reductions, those are still voter approved, the board would have to decide where to make those reductions along the way. A spending plan is, again, simply a not to exceed budget. Um, but if we had to reduce spending, we could accommodate that uh, through the course of the year through board action as well. Important to point out again, as we've said to people before, our budget is a value statement. It communicates our priorities. Where we devote our resources tells the community a lot about and for the community to express to each other and beyond what we value um, in terms of our financial support 
in, in the budget and in terms of program. So this executive budget uh, amended for revenue changes due to the state budget. It continues to commit uh, a commitment to supporting programs that are beyond the mandate. So contrary to what uh, some people might feel is an elimination of all non-mandated program, that's not the case. It is a reduction though significantly and it's every child across the spectrum. So it's a, a reduction in programming for uh, kids with all different difficulties and all different um, desire to seek different opportunities. It provides funding in support of the blueprint plans as well. We continue to focus on what our strategic plan prioritizes, but it also respects our taxpayers in the sense that we were told loud and clear that proposing a budget over the tax cap is not something that our community would like to do and we need to be respectful of that as well. Meanwhile, we have to honor our commitment to that 2017 project and the debt that we committed to, uh, to again, uh, transform buildings across the district and create better learning spaces for our students. Learning spaces that come closer to matching the quality of the instruction the kids are receiving as well. The presentation tonight will include the following information by statute. It's what uh, needs to be presented to you and included in your decision making as you're considering the adoption of this budget. It's the property tax report card, the revenue uh, summary. Uh, just ask people to make sure they, uh, they mute that. Well, you would have to enable your, find your picture. Give me one second. Or. And feel free when we get to the public comment section, if you uh, would like to, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself at that point, or if you put your hand up, we can unmute you as well. But in the meantime, it's uh, helpful if you just focus on keeping that muted as much as possible. Thanks so much, appreciate that. Uh, I know it's a technology for people to continue to get used to. In any case, uh, property tax report card, the revenue summary, the tax cap uh, limit calculation will walk you through where we get to 3.83%, summary of our appropriations by function, and the historical summary of those appropriations and by object as well as function. And then uh, three part budget and budget detail by function. Summary of staffing is also included for you. And then we want to make sure we uh, detail for you the four uh, resolutions, which is the approval of the budget. We would be requesting the approval of proposition one, which is to withdraw $2 million from our capital reserve to reauthorize the 2017 facility plan, and that's out of a reserve designated for capital improvements, and Proposition 2 withdrawing $300,000 from the technology reserve fund. And finally, the approval of the property tax report card as it stands at this point. Uh, to walk through uh, then that tax cap calculation, we want to make sure uh, that it's clear to you uh, how we get to this number. We look at last year, uh, the, or I'm sorry, the fiscal year ending 2020. So this past year's real property tax levy. Remember the tax cap is the allowable levy growth. So we start with what the levy was last year. We look at the tax base growth factor that's provided to us. The pilots receivable in this year, which have to be added to that number. Um, we look at the capital, I'm sorry, the allowable levy growth factor, the, the uh, point that I made before about 1.81, as opposed to 2%, which is sometimes thought of as the 2% property tax cap. It never has been that. And then pilots receivable coming into next year and any allowable carryover from last year, which was just $41 in our case. So before any adjustments are made, the tax levy limit going into next year was $54,542,995. That's up 1.95%. So that, based on the state's calculation, would say we can go from the $53.4 million to 54.5. That's the allowable growth. But the law allows for particular exclusions. So you can increase your levy additionally in certain ways because of different costs that you have and revenue that you need to collect. The first is the exclusion fiscal year uh, going into next year, one point, I'm sorry, $1 million total for us going into next year. And that is a 47% increase in the um, net required for tax levy from capital. And it's made up in two ways. 47% of the $1.6 million we are increasing to debt service going into next year, that's the capital project money we can exclude 47% of that from the, the levy growth. And an exclusion for a transfer from capital for BOCES expense, for capital expense, 
for a BOCES project. So in other words, when you have capital expense, part of that, not all of that, but part of that can be excluded from your total amount that you're allowed to increase your levy going into next year, which is what brings us to 3.83%. Otherwise, our allowable growth would only be 1.95%. And since we have that $1.6 million additional expense, totally separate from the rest of the budget, right, from the rest of the operations, we would have to fund that completely out of the revenue coming in for operations and not be able to exclude any of that expense um, from the, the uh, growth in the tax levy. In any case, it's the state's calculation and that gets us to 3.83% as our tax cap number. Never 2%, I should say almost never. That's a number that is not uh, used reliably. It's one of the multipliers but the property tax cap in New York State is different every year and it's different for every district based on each of these factors, which are different as well. The estimated revenue uh, coming into the district next year and some highlights. I'd like to talk to you about the sales tax, which will go down 12.67%. This is clearly a result of the pandemic and the crisis that we're involved in right now. That's a drop of $385,000. That's significant. A significant amount of revenue when you consider 1% on our tax levy is somewhere in the neighborhood of $450,000 in revenue. You can see where a drop of $385,000 in that revenue uh, really makes a big, big difference. Our investment income, although small, typically, we were expecting only, uh, we, we adopted last year an expected amount of $21,000, proposing uh, looking at investment income of only 10,000 going into next year, but that is down, of course, then 105% going into next year. Really important to point out this other category, a drop of 11% or $242,000. This includes a variety of drops in, in revenues, most particularly a local parochial school closing means a drop in the revenue we receive for providing service to students in that particular location, that school, that is reimbursed from other districts. So in terms of parentally placed students in a parochial school from another district, and that school being located in Brighton, we are required by law to provide service to those children if they need additional services and a variety of other services by statute, including nursing services, et cetera. But we are reimbursed a portion of that cost by those local districts. That is a drop in revenue. On the expense side, we also will not be spending as much to service those. However, the drop in revenue is greater than the drop, than the drop in expense because part of that revenue goes to pay for additional administrative costs throughout the district that does not result in a change in our spending here. In other words, it contributes towards a variety of uh, services, overhead costs, essentially for running the program in the district, but it's not great enough that it would result in us actually being able to reduce that uh, corresponding amount of staffing to be an, a further savings on the expense side. So there's a gap there as well. We're talking about a use of reserves to increase going into next year by 105% or $900,000 as well. That's the rainy day. We need to use those rainy day funds right now because it is more than raining, it is pouring. And we are looking at, of course, then a change in the revenue coming in in terms of state and federal aid of only 0.52%, and that's in the first category up top. Only 0.52%, our state aid being held flat in terms of foundation aid uh, going into next year, and slight changes of only $89,000 in other federal aid. So that in total is an increase of 3.01% in revenue coming in to the district. Our estimated resulting tax rate from this budget would be $26.09 per $1,000 of assessed value and for its phone value to $220,000, a total cost of $198 of an increase into next year. I'd like to point out again this foundation aid issue very quickly. You've seen this chart many, many times. We should be receiving in 2021 well over $16 million, only going to be receiving over $8 million. There is an $8 million gap between what we are slated to receive and what we will, what we should be receiving. And remember, this amount is based on our kids. This is real data. The needs of our kids within the formula are reflected in the total amount due. And we are only receiving about half of what the state owes us based on their formula. On the left-hand side of this uh, slide, it shows you the average of our peer group they receive 81% of their foundation aid. We simply only receive 51.8%. And it's complicated for why this happens, but the simple explanation to you is 
our total amount due has grown faster than other people, while the amounts being paid by the state have stayed relatively flat. And those amounts for us have grown because our student population has shifted. We are a district that continues to grow, albeit slightly, while other groups, while other districts are shrinking. So their total amount due has shrunk. Therefore, their percentage that they're being paid, the mathematical computation has grown. While our total amount due has grown faster and our aid has remained relatively flat over time. So we're only receiving 51.8% of what is due. On the right hand side, it shows you that the increase in our foundation aid due over the last 10 years has been $4.7 million. Again, based on our kids, our real data, this formula reflects our data each year, the actual children that we are working with. But the increase in foundation aid paid over that 10 year period has only been $2.7 million. So not only were they not funding the formula in the first place, they haven't come close to funding our growth in the formula. Our percent change in the amount due to us has gone up almost 40%, 39.2% but the growth that they funded has only been 57.8%. Again, 2.7 of the 4.7 in total due. I think this is an interesting perspective and for people to understand how does this compare to our neighbors, really important to have an understanding because many people have said to us in this current budget, why are we reducing maybe further than other people are? This tells that tale pretty vividly. If you take a look at the red arrow right in the middle of your screen, that's Brighton. We are only receiving again 50% ballpark of our aid due. The next column over, our neighbor to the east, Pittsburgh, is receiving 63% of their aid due. If you take a look at the first statement at the bottom of your screen, that's we would be getting $1.99 million more if we were getting 63% of our aid. The parentheses at the end show you again our current gap of $1.7 million going into this proposal. The pandemic gap, I will call it would have been more than covered if we were receiving that 63% like Pittsburgh. Furthermore, if you take a look at the average across the state of 81%, we'd be at about that number right there, about that place in the chart, closer to where gates Chilai is, between Greece and gates Chilai, and we would be getting then $4.9 million more in aid. Let's go back to that number I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, about $500,000 in revenue ballpark, 450 to 500,000, in revenue by 1% on the levy, you're talking about almost a 10% difference in your taxes because of this gap. And that's not even the 100% allocation, that's the 81% that similar districts across the state are getting. So our gap in the beginning of this budget process was 2.4 million. Our secondary, our pandemic gap was 1.7, that total is 4.1 million. Well, this 4.9 would more than cover both of those gaps and we'd still have $800,000 to reduce the levy, levy or maintain program. Just to go through with you a couple of the expenses going into next year so people understand where their money is going. The bulk of our spending always is on salaries, of course, and benefits. We are a people business. That's where your focus should be and your resources should be devoted to. Salaries will drop by 3.2%, not individual salaries. Of course, those are collectively negotiated, bargained and determined across the district, but the total spending on salaries due to the drop of the number of people being employed in the district, 27 positions total being reduced will be a reduction of $1.1 million in total in salaries. The other important number to point out is on the bottom of your screen, the debt service payment that I mentioned to you, that's the car payment that we are required to lift into our spending now. No different than when you go out and need to buy a car. If you didn't have car payments before in your household budget, but you now have a car that uh, has become obsolete, you have to go buy a new one, you have a new payment, and you didn't have any payments in your household budget, you've got to lift that into your monthly spending, your annual spending. Well, we need to do the same thing. That debt service did not exist. We agreed to it. We are constructing because of it. And now we need to pay it $1.6 million lifted into the budget in this current year and no option there. The support services impacted by the budget decision are important for you to, to be aware of and for the community to understand as well. We're modifying our instructional leadership and professional development program. These again, all reductions based on a shortfall in revenue. Modified our music program for fourth grade. We will still have fourth grade instrumental music. It will look different with a reduction in staffing. Modifying our class size and course offerings throughout the district. Modified team teaching structure at TCMS. We will still have some team teaching, uh, the team structure, but it will look different than what it currently does. We will be reducing uh, literacy cutting, as a matter of fact, literacy and math coaching supports. Cutting foreign language for sixth grade. That program then will begin in seventh grade. We will still have foreign language but not until uh, sixth grade. 
important to point out along the way, as I mentioned these, that we looked at areas where we could reduce instead of, or restructure instead of cut entirely. We also looked at places where if we made a reduction this year for a kid, so for example, foreign language is a great, great place to, to point this out. We do not want to cut foreign language in sixth grade. That would not be our recommendation to you. That is a program highly valued by our community, by us as educators. We do know though that kids will be able to begin their foreign language in seventh grade. So it doesn't entirely eliminate their opportunity, of course, for foreign language, whereas some other program reductions, if made, would entirely eliminate the program and kids would not have that opportunity the following year, uh, particularly for very small programs. Uh, we also look on the right-hand side of restructuring our AIS services and supports. That's reducing some of the non-mandated, not entirely, but some of the non-mandated support. Our summer school offerings as well. Reducing our interscholastic athletic supports. We will maintain all of our teams but we will have less money budgeted for material supplies and perhaps less contests available uh, for students on those teams. We will, however, still maintain all of our teams going into next year. We're reducing uh, some of our co-curricular and extracurricular opportunities. Those will be determined uh, through the course of the planning process at the secondary level, but we will reduce the amount we are able to fund in terms of uh, club and activity stipends as well. And reducing transportation services that occur before September 1st which is, would be non-mandated services, we will not be able to provide those no matter when any school actually begins their academic year until after September 1st uh, for all those receiving transportation in the district. A summary of staffing changes, and I won't read all the numbers at you. Uh, this is uh, largely directed towards people being able to go in and take a look at exactly uh, what those are. At the top, the administrative position, the assistant director of humanities position has been cut. The next group of positions are teachers, and uh, they all together um, are, let's see, uh, I'm sorry, let me make sure I have the right one, 14.7 positions total, that's on the far right-hand side, three academic support instructors, a 0.95 total in reduction in clerical support, five paraprofessional positions, two of our school aid security personnel, and 0.3 of the school nurse position, and that's the Siena position, of course, that school closing, so we're able to reduce uh, the hours for that position as well. The elementary class size will be affected, as we mentioned, in terms of the reduction. We're looking then at grade uh, one having 10 sections. This year we have 11, 10 sections in grade two. This year we have 11. There'll be 11 sections in grade three. This year we have 12. We'll remain constant in grades four and five with 12 sections each. And you can see the oval circle around the projected class sizes, 18.6 in each of the kindergarten AM and PM. 23, 22, 21, 22, 23 then in grades one through five. Those are not ideal, they are manageable. And I say that as a former elementary teacher and principal as well. We know that we would much prefer to have smaller classes. We know that that would work better instructionally, that I'm not diminishing that. I do say to you though, I have a tremendous amount of confidence in our staff in being able to accommodate those class sizes instead of much larger ones that are being faced by districts around the county, some of our closest neighbors seeing much larger class sizes at the elementary level. Service level reductions um, are important to point out as well. These are those that affect uh, people and program, but not specifically reducing personnel. So those extracurricular clubs and after school activities I mentioned to you, the dollar impact is $15,000. Coaching support, supplies, materials, the competitions I mentioned to you, but no team reductions of $60,000. The K-5 summer school program, $60,000, summer curriculum development, $20,000, assessments, all travel and conference budgets as well of $30,000. And equipment funding would be limited to what they would be if we had a contingent budget. So in other words, the essential for maintenance of program health and, or for health and safety, which is a definition in the law, that'll be a $50,000 reduction and supplies and materials to all building and department budgets of $60,000 for a total non-staffing reductions of $295,000. That is, again, trying to keep reductions as far away from kids and the instructional program as possible. These all have an impact, of course, we know that, uh, but they are not um, uh, staffing positions per se. Again, to remind the community of the capital outlays, that $1.6 million that I mentioned to you, if you take a look at the graph on the left-hand side, it shows you the blue bar, what our tax cap number allows. That's the $198 increase for a home value of $220,000. But well, what's that made up of? That's made up of two big chunks, $97, which is what's being levied specific for capital. 
you take a look at the right hand side, the average annual impact that we had presented in the 2017 vote was an estimated impact of $144. And right now we're levying $97 of that going into next year. So we've more than fulfilled that promise, of course, as well. And then the levy for operations is $101. And so if we were only levying taxes going into next year for operational expenses, that would be $101. And again, that's also why that exception gets made within the property tax cap calculation, uh, because you're talking about $97 of the total increase or the 198 having to go towards capital. And if that $97 uh, was, was not excluded or a portion of it, remember only 47%, that would eat up most of the levy increase going into next year, requiring us to cut programs dramatically to accommodate for that. The debt service deferral is important to point out. We're proposing a bridge for our future obligations and using reserves to get there uh, so that we, again, are not eating into program further in, a, in order to accommodate that increase. The yellow bar represents fund balance that we're suggesting using going into next year uh, to pay the financing so that we have that lift and 21, 22 and on that uh, financing is then part of the package. You'll notice the orange bar is the building aid being received. More building aid follows the more the expense is paid. The debt service will go up again next year. We will budget for that, but it has a corresponding revenue uh, to a much more significant degree going forward. And then that levels out into future years. The reserves and fund balance picture is important for you to know about and for our community to understand. We would be looking at our reserves estimated on June 30th of $6.9 million in building reserve. And we're asking the, in Proposition 2 to, uh, for voters to authorize a withdrawal of $2 million from that reserve to pay additional costs associated with the project approved in 2017. The technology reserve of just over $1 million, we're asking to liquidate the rest of that reserve uh, to withdraw $300,000 from the reserve to finance in whole or part acquisition and release of new equipment. Uh, I'm sorry, not to liquidate that entirely. The estimated balance on June 30th is $1 million, uh, which it, it currently is, of course. And we're using Proposition 3, uh, $300,000 to purchase technology equipment. And that way we don't have to do that out of our general fund. Bus purchase reserve will be $300,000 on June 30th. And the balance will be maintained for future purchase or replacement of district buses and co-curricular or extracurricular activities. By the way, when we've been able to purchase uh, the current mini buses that we're using in the district right now, uh, partly through these types of uh, spending uh, allotments, but also through, um, you know, the generosity of the Brighton Education Fund, et cetera. Those have been essential now in providing travel for small teams, clubs, activities, and uh, delivering food in this current circumstance to families throughout the district as well. The unemployment reserve will be $452,000 on June 30th, and we'd like to appropriate $56,000 to pay for unemployment wages and claims, which we're expecting to come up. Uh, insurance reserve will be $300,000 on June 30th. And the uh, proposed budget relies on a reserve to pay for unbudgeted replacement of instructional hardware devices that is issued to students. Tax surcharge claim $401,000. And we rely on that reserve to, bud to pay for any unbudgeted uh, judgments that may come up. The Evlar account is $1.1 million on June 30th. The budget relies on that reserve again for unbudgeted payout of contractual benefits which is what the reserve is intended for. The IRS reserve of $3.9 million, we ask for appropriating $465,000 from that reserve to offset costs of the levy. Again, the, retirement re the retirements themselves bill us, and that's from the state. It's a state expense billed to us for our employees. And those reserves were set up to be able to offset that expense from the annual budget. And TRS reserve will be $1.1 million. And we would want to use that to the extent that TRS obligations in 2021 exceed what we have budgeted for. So if that rate happens to exceed, if there's an adjustment made greater than what we are budgeting for, we would need to use the reserve to accommodate for that as well. I would point out to you, the current balance of 568, increasing that to 1.1 is helpful as we are expecting that uh, percentage because it's based on market performance, that contribution rate, it's balanced over several years <clears throat> Excuse me, but that will likely, based on the current uh, economic condition in, in our country and in the market, require an increase in the future uh, to that rate. And having that reserve will be helpful in ho helping to offset at least some of that increase that we're expecting to come over time. 
Uh, so that's been smart financial planning on your part to make sure that reserve was in place. Again, just to remind you of that history, the initial challenge was $2.4 million. The pandemic, this crisis that everybody's experiencing, gave us an additional gap of 1.7 million. We reduced spending 1.3 and then took out the pandemic assessment to close that to 1.7, although that may still occur. And then we have this just totally unprecedented potential for reductions throughout the year that we would be counting on reserves uh, to accommodate or other reductions we may need to make um, going forward, but we would like uh, the opportunity to potentially look at that through reserves. And that's the, the total, again, uh, $1.6 million in the middle of the screen just shows you what could happen if there's a 20% reduction. If people are curious what they can do about that, please continue to think about federal advocacy. We've certainly uh, throughout the district spoken about this, communicated about this. Uh, we are exceptionally hopeful as is the governor who has made this very public for an opportunity for more help to come from Washington DC to our state, but to be designated specifically for schools and for local governments, which is very important for all of our quality of life in terms of everything that happens at the local level. And that would hopefully be able to offset the dramatic drop in revenue that the state is seeing and what could be a consequence of that, which would be a dramatic drop in revenue paid out to school districts and to municipalities. The estimated impact on tax rates, the number that people are typically looking for in this conversation, our tax levy would go up 3.83%. This assumes a 0.25% appreciation in the tax base. That rate's never final until the tax warrant is approved in July, of course, because it depends on the property values at that point. But the impact on the home assessed at $220,000 would be $198 in Brighton and $198 in Pittsburgh. We've been asked before why the difference in the current tax base number of over $2 billion in taxable property value in the town of Brighton versus $29 million in Pittsburgh. It's important to point out that that's because only a portion of Pittsburgh properties, a small portion of that, are part of the Brighton Central School District. The value of those properties that are included um, in some of our neighborhoods, for example, where we know we have Town of Pittsburgh homes, but they are Brighton School District homes, the value of those properties is $29.8 million. This isn't an assessment of the entire tax base in Pittsburgh, just those that are in the Brighton School District. The property tax report card, we're taking a look um, at that total number again in the middle of your screen of 3.83%. And that's due to the calculations from the state that we went through at the beginning of the presentation. This is the official document that's provided to the state that provides the calculation ultimately that we present to you. And finally, again, those capital reserve and the technology reserve, the other propositions, the current balance, $7.9 million. And we'd request to withdraw $2 million we have to ask the community for permission to do that as we had to ask the community for permission to set that reserve up, but that would allow us uh, to continue to fund the, uh, any changes, additional expenses in the 2017 program. We know over time those costs escalate, they change, construction changes that, for example, asbestos abatement in the auditorium at the high school, much more extensive than we would have known about or planned. And we have to accommodate for those for, for health and safety and design reasons but that results in additional costs. The reserve is set up to protect us then from having to go back to taxpayers and ask for additional authorization or an additional tax to be levied. This is the reserve, but we do have to ask for permission to use that reserve. And again, that buttresses us from those changes in the expenses. And in the technology reserve fund, the current balance is just over $1 million. And as we had mentioned, we'd like to withdraw $300,000. That would be to continue our one-to-one -one program, the secondary level, the purchase of eighth grade uh, tablets, staff laptop replacements, and that is because that is the computer that each of our staff members uses. They don't use a desktop and a laptop. They have one computer and audiovisual hardware replacements as well. I don't think there's ever been a better time to talk to you about withdrawing from the technology reserve fund as we see our students interacting and using that technology on a daily basis. I am so glad that over the past uh, several years, we've been able to build towards this point where this was an opportunity for our kids to learn remotely I think that, you know, a lot of credit to you for supporting that and uh, leaders throughout the district, Lou Alamo, Debbie Baker, for building towards that. Um, and many other people have made that happen. Mike Leaner plays a significant role in that as well, including our technology program, people like Eric Jordan, um, uh, you know, um, uh, as well, uh, heading that up. We, we really are, are, and Pete Marion, so incredibly great, grateful for that happening and all the work you're doing right now. Uh, to maintain that program and promote that program. So thank you for that. And finally, a summary altogether, we're saying that our key budget attributes, integrity, respect, responsibility, self-control, like our Brighton beliefs, 
We believe our budget reflects those as well. It's a spending proposal of $82.94 million, an increase of just over 3%, 1% operations again, and that capital expense is just over 2% as well. It reflects our investment in our priorities in the district, our blueprint priorities, safety, security, wellness, rigorous coursework for all kids, creativity and innovation, instructional technology, diversity, equity, inclusion. It also responds to mandated increases in spending, continues our investments in program, but it responsibly trims to minimize our impact on students where we made very careful decisions around uh, cutting with a scalpel, uh, I think is, is the best way we've been able to describe that very strategically as opposed to uh, dramatic wholesale change wherever possible. And it also honors, of course, the tax impact of the 2017 facility improvement project and the capital work being done throughout the district. It's very important to point out how important people's vote is and what they need to do about that vote. I want to be very clear with people. These uh, strategies, this structure, the process for voting was developed by executive order and given to school districts across the state. There was not an option, there was not a choice, there was not a um, decision made by school districts. In fact, I will not hesitate to say to you that despite the vociferous uh, lobbying on behalf of uh, school personnel, staff members, and school board members throughout the state, the process became very, very complicated. And we want to make sure it is not complicated for you on the user end. We want to make sure that it is clear as possible and that everybody who wants to vote and participate in an election has an opportunity to do so. So let me be very clear with you. Voting is all by absentee ballot. All by absentee ballot. No in-person voting is allowed by executive order. We have the budget hearing next week, seven o'clock, May 26, Zoom conferencing, and you will be able to visit the, the uh, bcsd.org for a link to that meeting. But remember, all by absentee ballot, qualified voters. There are three ways you qualify to vote. Citizen of the United States, 18 years of age, and a resident for 30 days prior to the vote. That's by state law, again, not a Brighton choice. How's the absentee ballot gonna work? going to work, you might ask? Well, we are sending one ballot to every household with our district newsletter, the budget newsletter. Every single household will get that one ballot. It includes with it a postage paid, paid envelope for you to return to the district your ballot. Anybody else who would like a ballot that meets the qualifications should simply let us know and we will get a ballot out. Vote at bcsd.org. Let me say that one more time. Vote at bcsd.org is the email address to use to get a ballot. If you need to call, call 242-5200 extension 5502 by June 5th and we can mail that to you. And the reason for June 5th is the ability to get that to you and then have it returned needs that window of time for you to request the ballot. So again, please by June 5th, request a ballot, vote at bcsd.org and we will send out as many as we need to send out. We are equipped to do that. But we sent one ballot per household because each ballot requires three, essentially three pieces of paper or envelopes. That's 36,000 duplications. To do two ballots would have been 72,000 and incredibly wasteful, confusing, and perhaps it would have caused greater difficulty in the voting. So we will send out as many ballots as people would like if they're qualified voters and it follows an absentee ballot process where there's an attestation as to your qualification to vote. Again, all set up by the state citizen, 18 years of age and resident 30 days prior. Please let us know. We want uh, as many people participating as always as possible. That is always our goal, uh, no different this year. That concludes the presentation. I would ask, are there any questions from board members? Uh, Dr. McGowan, I think, <clears throat> thank you very much, first of all. I think what we're gonna do, the board will, will, will uh, step back a bit. We will have an opportunity shortly when we entertain a motion to approve the budget to have a conversation and ask questions further if we need to. So let's, I, I would like to put that on the back burner if we could. Uh, we will open the opportunity in a moment for public comment. Um, what you've presented to us tonight is not new to the board at all. As you mentioned, uh, we're on the same page as we've been, as we have been on pretty much for the last few weeks in terms of bringing this spending plan and, and tax levy forward. Um, I will, uh, before I open the opportunity for public participation, I just want to reiterate one point. If you need more absentee ballots, so everyone by this time, every residence has received a postcard 
detailing the information on how to vote, why to vote, why, how the logistics are working this year. The newsletter will go out in the mail along with one ballot, as Dr. McGowan said. Those will be in the mail later this week. So they will be received by uh, homes uh, beginning weekend into next Monday, May 18th, and they can be returned at any time. And if you do need more ballots for members of your household, please use the email address if at all possible. So vote at bcsd.org to request additional ballots. So if you have three persons living in your household who are qualified, you need two more, use the email and request two more. You can use the telephone if you need to, but it's much easier to send an email. We can process it better within central office. Um, the telephone it can get difficult at times. People leave voicemails, some questions, some clarifications. Anything that you need to know, please put it in the email using that vote at bcsd.org email address, and it will be handled much easier. So we appreciate that. And, uh, and then those ballots must be returned by the close of business on June 9th. And uh, we, we will make sure we continue to message throughout all of our platforms and remind folks as we go forward. So public participation. We have many members of the public that have joined us tonight on Zoom. We appreciate that. Public participation is an opportunity for any member of the public who wishes to do so to ask a question, make a comment. You can ask a question of the board or of Dr. McGowan. If it's something that we can answer this evening, we certainly will. If not, we will get back to you with, a, with an answer at a later date. If you would like, you can also wait and participate in the Facebook Live event tomorrow with Dr. McGowan, 3.30 to 4.30, and you can ask a question then also. Questions or comments this evening or tomorrow don't have to be about budget. They don't have to be about anything specific. They can be with regard to anything that a resident would like to bring up with regard to operation of the district. Um, I ask that what we're gonna do in a moment is ask you to uh, activate your video so that we can see everybody. It makes it a little difficult. Uh, raise a hand, we'll keep track. I don't know how many comments we might have. And we ask you to please be brief, um, be to the point, um, be polite, uh, and, uh, and we'll kind of go from there. So. Um, I guess what I first would do is, Dr. McGowan, can you get us back and not share your screen further right at the moment so that we can have as many people possible on the screen? Sure. And I can find people. So what I'm going to do right now is ask uh, any members of the public who are watching us this evening, I'm going to try to watch out for you. Um, if you raise a hand, I'll see that first. If you're not uh, if you're not on video, if you're not comfortable sharing video, after we get through anybody on video that I can see hands for, uh, we will then uh, go to a verbal system, but we're all well behaved here. We can make it work. So as I sit at my screen, I see a resident Eleanor Freer with a hand up very politely. So I'm going to first call on her. Thank well, you. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say it's such a difficult situation for for everybody, for the district, for the teachers and the families. And I, um, I just appreciate all the thought that's gone into the budget. And I can't even begin to imagine how much work this has been. And, I, um, and just how many difficult decisions have had to be made. And of course, nobody wants to cut anything at all. We want to expand our program. So I, I appreciate how difficult it's been. Um, but I just wanted to say a couple words about the foreign language cuts. Um, in the sixth grade because I feel really strongly about about um, my kids missing out on that opportunity and I know that you mentioned they'll still have the opportunity to do six years of a foreign language um, if they start in seventh and go through high school but to me it makes a big difference when you're cutting out a program that's part of the school day um, for example if you take away a football tournament or a, tr a trip to a an athletic event or something like that. Those are things that happen after school. So the kids are still engaged in classes during the school day. Or if you take away some support services that kids get pulled out for, they're still in a class where they're learning something with a teacher, you know, or if you cut instrumental music, they're st they were being pulled out of a class for that anyway. So they're still back in that class again learning. So to take away the sixth grade foreign language and um, replace it with a study hall, which I believe is the 
current thinking. I, I just don't really understand the thinking behind taking away um, the academic experience and replacing it with nothing. So I'd really love for the district to consider, you know, if they do have to cut that program, if there's a way that they can still keep the kids academically engaged um, during that time. And I don't know how that, what that would, how that would happen or what that would look like, but um, I think it's wrong to take that away and then just leave the kids to their own devices. Um, they already have 10th period as a so-called free period study hall. Um, and I feel like they don't, at that age, they don't really have the study skills to take advantage of yet another free period in the day. So I wanted to just um, express my opinion on that, but thank you very much for all your work. Well, thank you very much for your comment. We appreciate it. Uh, Dr. McGowan, do you have any further comment on that or? No, I think it's a point really well taken, Eleanor, and well expressed, and, and thank you for that. I think um, we need to really be reflecting a lot on our schedule and what we can do to make that time worthwhile. Um, but to your point, it is not what we wanted to be doing at all. And I know you understand that. I'm not <laughs> trying to sell you on it at all because we're not sold on it. But I think you bring up a really good point. And as, as we kind of creatively think over the next couple months about what school will look like next year, I think we need to make sure we're aware of that also and how we can more actively engage kids during that time. So very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else that's on the Zoom that I can see would, would like to raise their hand and make a comment or ask a question? I'm checking my screens here. We have a lot of people. Uh, so what I'm going to do now, we have a lot of folks who, uh, who aren't sharing video, which is entirely fine. I have no issue with that. If you are on the Zoom and want to make a comment or ask a question, what I'm going to ask you to do is unmute yourself and uh, give me your name and uh, let me recognize you. And I realize this is with 67 people on uh, the possibility of, but we'll handle it. So is there anyone else who wishes to make a comment or ask a question this evening? Going once. <laughs> All right, hearing, hearing that we have no additional comment, that that's entirely fine. Uh, we're, I guess a couple of things before we move on with the meeting. First of all, um, the enthusiasm that the public has shown us as far as joining in Zoom board meetings far exceeds by many multiples in-person attendance at board meetings. So we may look at reimagining board meetings as we move forward also in the new world. But thank you so much for weighing in. Thank you for paying attention. Before we move on, I just want to remind everyone all of the material discussed this evening and beyond is on the website. Sometimes it's difficult to find. Send us a note, we'll help you find it. But it is all there. If you have any questions or thoughts or comments, feel free to email Dr. McGowan, myself, or you can email it to Kim and she'll send it on to the, the uh, responsible parties and we will get an answer for you back. So thank you very much. And again, tomorrow afternoon, and Dr. McGowan is planning to continue Wednesday afternoon's uh, fireside chat for uh, the foreseeable future, at least through uh, the beginning of June or so, I think, and uh, we'll go from there. So at this point then, I would ask uh, a member of the Board of Education, please, for a motion to approve this evening's agenda. So moved. Moved by Marv. Second. Seconded by Larry. Tim, would you call the roll, please? All right, Andrea? Aye. Larry? Aye. Julene? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Christina? Aye. Mark? Aye. Thank you very much. Now, please, a motion for approval of the minutes from the April 20th, 28th, I'm sorry, 2020 education meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Julene and second. Tim, call the roll, please. Andrea? <coughs> Larry? Aye. Julene? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Christina? Aye. Mark? Aye. All right, I guess uh, now uh, a motion, please, for adoption of the 2020 2021 budget and approval of the 2020 2021 property tax report card. So moved. Second. Moved by Larry and seconded by Marv. 
discussion. This is our opportunity for the board. Are there any further questions of Dr. McGowan or of Lou Alimo with regard to what's been presented this evening with regard to the budget uh, or the tax cap itself? Any questions that anybody has? Uh, or any <clears throat> thoughts or comments that uh, any one of us would like to make or express? Uh, this is Christina. This is Christina. I was just going to say, you know, as a parent, we're all feeling uh, a, few, a real weight of these cuts as well. So, you know, as parents and all of our, you know, our district, we really love this district. So, you know, hopefully we'll move forward and, um, and things will improve as, as uh, you know, as we go forward. That's a very good point, Christina. Uh, thank you. As, parent, as current parents and parents of former students. And, uh, <laughs> uh, any other board members have thoughts that they wanted to share this evening or comment? This is Karen. I'd just like yep. to re reiterate that this is not the budget anyone wants to propose, but it's the budget we have to propose. Um, and though it seems like an impossible task, we do still have to seek some equity in the way education funding is distributed. So I know that that will be even more difficult over the next two to three years, but this has to come to a head. <coughs> I know that we're still working on that. I wanna reassure the public that we will continue to work with folks in Albany to, to try to get the share of, of the taxes you've already paid into the system to come back to us. So. Another very good point. I feel like Mark, it's already been stated. It's just, it's a, it's a really tough slog. It affects people. It affects really good staff who think, you know, who, who act on behalf of our kids every day. And um, it's just a really tough process. And, you know, my concern is we may or may not have seen all of the costs that are yet coming and we're working very proactively and defensively to defend what we've got. But I, I don't want people to think that once, a budget is approved that it's over because there will continue to be advocacy that still needs to take place. And um, we're going to have to really redouble our efforts at the local state and federal level. That's a very good point, Larry. And, uh, you know, just a reminder to folks, Dr. McGowan touched on it during his presentation. Uh, you know, right now, um, those of you that pay attention to the governor, whether you do so on a daily basis or not with his uh, updates, you know, today he was especially animated uh, with the federal government and the need for additional stimulus funding to go to states and directly to go to local governments and school districts. And we've talked about this now for a few weeks. Um, really right now, uh, he's, he, he continues to mention a 20% cut. Uh, we do expect this week, Friday, to hear uh, what the first adjustment might be to that rating period that the state put in play. Um, we have prudently planned some reserve funds, fund balance to use as, as best we can and for as long as we can. But what's yet to come and additional cuts from the state, we really don't know. So we do need, for those that are listening tonight, that are members of the public, uh, well, actually everybody that's listening tonight, if you're of a mind to do so, what we really need to do is, Dr. McGowan has posted a letter that we all put together that has been sent off previously to our federal leadership, along with uh, Joe Morelli, or uh, I'm sorry, including Joe Morelli, but also Senators Gillibrand, Schumer, but uh, Majority Leader Pelosi in the House and Majority Leader McConnell in the Senate. We really need to push. Um, you, you may have seen today that the House approved or has got sketched out for likely approval later this week, a $30 trillion additional stimulus or three trillion dollar package, one trillion of that is earmarked for state local governments, including schools. Right now, the Senate majority is not all that enthusiastic about that program. We really need to get messaging to Senator McConnell on behalf of all school children in this country. All states need this funding. School districts everywhere are in deep trouble going forward and will continue to do so as the economic toll of this pandemic builds. And it's not in our purview, but we all live in Brighton. Our local government is facing the same situation in terms of funding. So we need the federal government in an additional package, uh, federal 
uh, the, st the state and local government, the local governments and school districts specifically really need that money targeted directly to us so that we can stave off additional cuts and really try to rebuild a few items along the way. So that is one item that citizens are, I mean, take the letter and just send it off or send your own email or telephone directly to Mitch McConnell's office and say, look, we need funding for public education. That's all you have to do. They keep track of all those things and it's important to do. So thanks Larry for again, bringing that advocacy work up. Our advocacy work, you know, uh, with along with the Fight for Brighton folks and all the residents of Brighton what, that we've done with the state of New York and all of our representatives there and leadership is a bit on pause with the rest of New York. Let's face it, there's not a lot that they can do right at the moment, but we, have, we are maintaining those relationships, we're maintaining those conversations. And we will pick that up and continue to work on that, but that is a much longer term situation now. I, I hate to be that blunt about it, but we are in for a few years of uh, very difficult times with New York State funding. So, so that's where that is right now at the current moment of advocacy. So Kevin, did you have something you wanted to add to that? It, it, uh, I think almost anything we say at this point starts to sound superfluous, but <clears throat> I do wanna say this. Nobody came to this district to pull programs apart. Nobody, not one of us. None of you ran for the board for that purpose. Uh, you know, none of you are people that in your campaigns or your conversations said, I wanna get elected to curtail spending and do X, Y, and Z. And none of the administrators that I work with have any desire whatsoever to change the level of service that we're providing. And not a single staff member in this district works here because they'd like to do less. This is a place that we all came to and are a part of because of a sincere and deep desire to do more for kids and families, to, to build upon a tradition of excellence and to think deeply about how we can do more. That you don't come here unless you're ready to run full speed, you know, leap tall buildings, do your very best on behalf of every single child in this district. It's not a place for bystanders. It's not a place for people that wanna sit still. It's not a place for people that aren't willing to innovate. It just isn't. So the current circumstance, I, I just didn't want the moment to pass without saying to people, this is the last thing any of us would like to do. And I know you've said it, you've said it different ways, but every single person here finds this excruciating. We are always also desiring to cost people less. So this isn't that we also came here for a blank check so that we could somehow spend people's money frivolously and, and uh, just play in the sandbox, building programs and not thinking about the cost. It shouldn't be read as a responsibility or, or a lack of connection to the cost for people. You're all paying it, I'm paying it, we get that. So that is also an important part of the equation. But in that conversation has been a balance in a community that if the cost is right, wants to invest in kids and program and always has for many, many, many years. Um, so we did our very best in finding ways that we found most equitable, most tolerable as educators, uh, most accommodating, but the human cost is dramatic. And although I, I present it in a way because we're, you're, we're used to the numbers and we've been talking about it and we've been engaged with it and we're talking about it in a bigger picture, recognize that the 27 people are a gigantic loss for this community, for this staff, for this team of people doing what they can for kids. And it's not taken lightly. So the moment as you adopt this should not pass without recognizing that 27 people will not be providing that service to kids anymore. And that is a real human impact to them, to their families, but to the children that they were serving. So our hope and our commitment is over time to rebuild what we can rebuild, to do it in ways that build on the success that we've had before and think about new and innovative ways to do things, to improve programming, and that's always our goal but to be committed to the kids and community members here and our staff members, this important team of people doing this work, that that is our commitment. Our commitment is not to drive down programming, but to build it up. This is not the end of this difficult conversation, however. And so this may go on for a while, and this may be challenging for a while. We are in it for the long haul. We are in it to build back. We are in it to be better each and every day. I have exceptional confidence in the people who are here and who will do the work going into next year, that they will make it a wonderful experience for people's kids. I don't doubt that for a second. It will be more challenging, but they will do that because that's who they are. That's what they signed up for. Um, our goal is not to be driving down programming, but to be building it. 
And over time, that's what we will do. It will just take time to get to that place. So we thank everybody for their patience. And we're a victim of the circumstance and apologize that we have to be, but that is what it is that we're all facing. Thanks. Well, thank you, Kevin, very well said. Julian, did you have something to add? I just wanna thank Kevin and Lou and Debbie and the entire leadership team and everybody who, while we've been reimagining education, meeting social and emotional needs of kids, feeding families, they've also had to do this really, really difficult work in a really short time. N nobody thought ever envisioned that we would be in the place that we're in, but they've just done extraordinary and remarkable work in the last eight weeks. And I just wanna say thank you to those of you who are here tonight and everybody who's out there who isn't here because you all have just done an extraordinary job. The teachers have done an amazing job and the families have done an amazing job in, in, in the changes that have happened in their lives too. So I just wanna say thank you to everybody and we, we will move forward and we will continue to do the work and we will still be a great district. So just thank you. You're welcome, Julian. Thank Very you. Very well put, Julian. And uh, you know, Kevin, your remarks and obviously the entire board uh, shares those thoughts and we've talked about it a number of times. And uh, the one thing I will say before we call the vote is, you know, we've talked, I've talked about, we talked about it in the context of moving from learning in a building to crisis learning online, uh, about school not being a building. Not only is it not a building, school in Brighton and learning in Brighton and what makes Brighton great are people. And certainly the leadership that we have in this district is unparalleled. But our teachers and staff delivering every day, delivering right now under difficult circumstances, reaching out, connecting with families, they will continue to deliver the Brighton education that they're so devoted to. That's our faith, that's our hope, that's our knowledge, we know that. It's horrible that we're gonna lose great people. Nobody signed up for that, you're right, and that's certainly not anything we wanted to do. But we will find a way to move forward build back, continue to add program, continue to deliver what the ex to the expectations of our families, our students, and our teachers. Our teachers' expectations for their students are as high or higher than anybody else involved in this. So we do appreciate that effort. And it's that faith in them making this, that will make this work going forward. So we're all in it together. Nobody's bailing out. And um, we're gonna make it work one way or the other. So. Thank you, and thank you for everybody that's uh, commented and contributed this evening. So at this point, I guess Kim will ask you to call the roll on approving the budget for 2020-2021. Andrea? Andrea? Yes, <laughs> there's a yes. <laughs> Me? Aye. Yeah. Julian? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Christina? Aye. Marv? Yes. Thank you. The technology did not want us to take that vote. Is what yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And uh, we, we now move on and make it all work. So. In that regard, I, I, we will turn it over to uh, Dr. Baker at this point. Uh, ELA, English Language Arts, was one of the programs that we evaluated over this past year. And Dr. Baker is here this evening to present that report and uh, tell us a little bit more about that program evaluation. Dr. Baker. Sure, Mark, thank you very much. Actually, tonight joining me is Julie Kopp, uh, assessment coach for the district, Heather Bonadonna, high school English teacher and Deanna Spagnola, who is, as you know, our assistant director of communities. They're gonna do the bulk of the presentation. So I'm just giving them a second to make sure that they're on unmute and we'll get started. So, um, you know, this is the second, um, second evaluation that we've done this year. Uh, the last uh, evaluation was presented at our last board meeting, the extended studies, and tonight we present the English language arts. Um, just really want to do a shout out, a thank you to the committee as the board sees here. Um, as usual, well represented. A lot of passionate people really wanting to um, engage in what is basically a year-long process. Is including our board members, you'll see names, 
Um, and really, you know, these are dedicated individuals who gave their time to say what is happening, what's working for our kids and the world of ELA and what do we need to do better. So this year's program of Val, um, we actually are kind of starting to hone. Um, this is the third time um, in my career here in Brighton that we've done an English um, evaluation and we really wanted to kind of focus it on thinking about in a broader sense, um, meeting some of the goals that we have as a district in the blueprint, particularly around diversity and equity. And so as you'll see, kind of our three main areas of focus this year were to really look at our student achievement to see if there were disparities between some of our subpopulation, subgroups of um, students, our students of uh, um, low SES, students in poverty, if you will, students with disabilities, um, students with uh, students of color, really wanted to take a look at that. Second, Deanna led a group um, to really look at our uh, text. And because in, in the English language arts, the texts we read are really crucial and they can do an awful lot towards moving, if you will, that program along. So we wanted to make sure that those texts reflected um, the diversity that is our student population. And then finally, Julie um, led a group that really took a look at her writing. This is the second time that we've really focused on writing instruction because we know how valuable it is to the overall development of a reader and a writer. And we wanted to make sure that if we were doing the best that we can, and if we weren't, um, that, there were th that there were things that we needed to be doing, we needed to make sure that happened. So I'm gonna turn it over to Heather Bonadonna now, um, like I said, English teacher at the high school, to talk about the student achievement area of the work. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, in the student achievement area, the, in grades three to eight, we targeted a data set in, which included students who scored a one or a two on last year's ELA assessment. But in addition to that, we also reviewed students' MAP performances and specifically noted whether students reached growth targets. The MAP growth goals are standardized measures that project a student's performance using a nationally <clears throat> normed sample, excuse me. Students can meet their growth targets and still not pass the ELA, because some students come in so far below grade level that they show significant growth, but they do not score a three or four yet. Um, and then in grades nine to 12, the data set included those who scored less than 65 in the New York State Regents exam. But we also took another step and tried to focus on um, AP, English AP English courses, and we were looking at trends in enrollment for those. And then we can move on to results. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <clears throat> so the results that were noted in grades three to five, we did not see any significant patterns for growth goals regarding um, the extent or type of services received. But in transfer students, once they received intervention services, they did begin to meet their growth targets. In grades six to eight, there was a consistent pattern of those who scored low on the ELA exam and, and those who also did not meet their growth goals. And diving a little bit deeper into that, we found that the biggest barrier to that was the scheduling that was in, impacting the way that AIS could be delivered at the middle school. So often teachers would have a group of a dozen students with a wide range of needs to cover all in one class period. So that's something that we need to look a little bit more closely at. Um, and then at the high school and grades, 9 to 12, we only had 12 students who scored lower than a 65 on the readiness exam. And then looking more closely at those students, we find that there are a lot of different factors that were impacting that progress. And then highlights. So the recommendations, and this is just a few, these are just a few of the recommendations. We have a lot of them in the full report, but this is just a, a nice little overview. Um, so for Council Rock, <clears throat> we'd like to take a deeper look at the data to determine if patterns emerge. There also has been a brand new reading program that's been put into place in the last two years. And we need to actually monitor that and look at the um, impact that that reading program is having on the development of our youngest readers. At um, TCMS and FRES, we'd like to conduct a further review of the AS delivery structures and the curriculum looking for consistency with one another and allowing students to continue reading writing development as the grades, <clears throat> as they progress in grades. Um, at the high school, we do need to explore why we have fewer students of color that are participating in advanced placement English, English classes. 
And then I'm going to hand it over to Diana to talk about culturally responsive reading. Thank you. Thanks everyone for having me here tonight. I am glad to talk about the work that we did. I want to give a shout out to my uh, subgroup committee that I worked with and thank you to them. And also thank you to the entire committee who along the way joined my group to help support looking at the text that we looked at. Uh, together we approximately reviewed over 175 uh, core text. So thank you to all of those folks and thank you to them also for challenging one another's thinking as we tried to remain focused and focus on this important work, challenging my thinking, engaging in very rich conversation and dis in discussion, and asking some important questions of one another. So together we examined uh, the core texts that were involved with our ELA units, grades 3 through 11. And we were using a tool, the Culturally Responsive Curriculum Scorecard. Through that, we wanted to ensure that, quite frankly, the texts that our students are reading and what they're looking at reflect them, reflect our Brighton Central School District students, and that they also have access to all of our students, have access to complex and rich texts and opportunities to engage with them in a variety of different ways. We were examining how diverse people are, int are introduced in these texts, how characters are represented in society, how they are, their experiences, uh, the settings that these books take place in, also in addition to that, the time period. Also, we took some time to think about the backgrounds of the authors that they represent, the regions of the world that are represented in the text that we read, not to mention only the areas of our own country. So here's what we found. What we found is that the units that were written more recently did represent a broader repertoire of diversity. There were richer characters, backgrounds. Um, examples might include um, non-white male characters in a hero role. We may see more of those in some of those units that, or those texts that were used in units that were reviewed more recently. So some time needs to be spent looking again at some of the units previous to that and future units. Uh, we did notice that some titles were repeated between grade levels, and at one point we asked some questions about that, but we came to learn that if the texts were repeated, it may often be because at one grade level they were used as a shared reading experience, and another grade level it was an independent or instructional or maybe a mentor text. And what we also found was with the units that are written more recently, there was a lot of co collaboration between grade levels and in some cases even between buildings, for example, Fifth grade teachers may use a text as a mentor text where it's used in independently at the sixth grade, but those conversations are happening between teachers as they're looking to select their text, they're asking one another, have you used this and are you using this? We also came to learn that um, text may be used differently in terms of being in a literature circle or in a whole group reading. And in that case, we also want to spend some extra time looking at if a youngster is going to be, or a student is going to be selecting a text to read, that the list of those texts for that particular unit are a diverse, represent diverse backgrounds, reflect our Brighton Central School District culture, community, and backgrounds of all of us in the community as well. We did not take the time to look at the uh, texts that are used at grades K through two. And that is because those units are not organized in the common unit format, the similar to grades three through 11. But that you'll see in a future recommendation is something that we want to take a look at. And we also want to take a look at too, the, as a unit is laid out, it may not represent or may not specifically cite the texts that are being used for differentiation purposes or for some more struggling readers. We're not saying that those aren't diverse text, but we want to make sure that we include those in future lists. So I alluded to some of our recommendations. The biggest piece that we all came out of was saying is that we wanted to learn more, we wanted to continue this work, and professional development was needed, not only for ourselves, but as we go forward and continuing to look at this. It was a daunting task between looking at text complexity and also the diversity of the text that we're using across our units and several more years of work could be done there. However, um, we want to ensure and better look at the unit design and the text selection so that other groups are represented. Some of those groups might, rep the author diversity is a, is a piece of that. 
where in our country or in the world do our authors come from? Um, are different family structures represented in the text that our children are reading? Um, who are the hero characters in the text that are reading? How, as I said before, non-white male characters in a hero role or Asian Latinx characters, religious backgrounds and some contemporary issues. And again, I also reference regions of the world and our own nation itself that those are represented. And essential to all of this is professional development for the folks that are going to be working on that unit design and selecting those texts so that everyone feels comfortable and well-versed in asking the challenging questions that we asked of ourselves and looking for more resources and looking for more guidance, which is critical. And as I said before, taking a look at the texts that are selected at the K2 level. Thank you. And okay. now Julie, I was gonna say, and now Julie will present our writing achievement. <laughs> So I'm, I'm Julie, and um, I, I had the opportunity to chair the subcommittee uh, that was looking at writing achievement. Thank you to the subcommittee who worked with me in developing this proposal. Um, it was interesting to finish out the work, um, you know, in a distance learning format, um, but we, we, we got there. Um, with respect to the uh, work that we did, we started the process by creating a vision that was supported not only by the expertise of those who were on the committee, but also going to national experts to define what a high quality writing program actually looked like. And as we go through um, the recommendations, you'll note that um, the way we collected data was actually aligned to the vision that we created and the recommendations come out of that um, looking at the gaps and where, where we saw the gaps between where our current program is and what the vision of um, a quality program would actually look like. Um, to identify uh, where our existing program was, we looked at, uh, in particular, the extended response um, data, which means the data from really the essays that are part of the New York State um, ELA test, the 11th grade English Regents test, and the Global and U.S. History Regents test, because all of them have students writing, writing extended responses. In addition, we looked at the type and purpose of writing include in, included in the common units, that are part of our 3-8 and beginning to be a part of our 9-12 instructional experiences. And we also did a survey of K-12 ELA teachers and then 6-12 um, teachers in the, in the content areas to learn about writing in the content areas because one of the things we learned is that it, their sh writing should be done across the content areas. When we looked at um, the results, what we did find was that students K-11 are having a balance of narrative, expositive, or excuse me, narrative, expository, and um, argument writing opportunities. Um, with that said, the opportunities that students are having in K through two um, are not necessarily um, aligned with the same performance standards. So while one teacher might have one expectation for a narrative, another teacher, teacher might have another expectation for what that narrative, narrative actually might be. With respect to research, our students are engaging in research multiple times across content areas and within their ELA courses. And the ELA teachers noted that they appreciated the research that was being done in the other content areas because they could see students' um, flexibility in their approaches to conducting research in the, result, in the work that, that was happening in ELA. We noted that writing to think, which is really a visible thinking strategy that we have promoted in the district across the last probably five to seven years, is beginning to take hold, although not being used um, to the same degree uh, across different classrooms. And that also the notion in the 21st century that students have the opportunity to produce multimodal modal text, which means that kids would be producing something with illustrations, with data um, displays, as videos as part of what they're presenting um, is an opportunity that are given to students. Writing across the content areas, we found that teachers are giving kids many opportunities to write across the content areas. And they're frustrated by um, the, the, the fact that they don't have teach time to spend um, time teaching writing in the content areas. 
and that the students um, don't necessarily always believe that writing in science is the same as writing in ELA might be, and their attention to grammar and structure and uh, mechanics isn't what a science teacher might like it to be necessarily. With respect to the variety of assessments, we have a, a nice balance of on-demand and curriculum embedded um, assessment tasks, with the difference there being that on-demand is a time situation where kids are writing you know, off the top of their head with little rehearsal, whereas curriculum embedded is a task where students have opportunity for feedback during the learning process and have the ability to incorporate that feedback into their work. In addition, um, students have an opportunity to write for authentic audiences, and um, they also um, spend, spend some time um, at the high school level especially uh, working to, to um, perfect their academic writing. Um, with respect to clear expect expectations for writing, uh, we believe that um, students have clear expectations in grades um, three through 11. In grades K through two, um, we might come back around to looking at what expectations are for the writing given the fact that we don't have um, units of study where there are common performance expectations for that writing. With respect to um, purpose and audience, we note that students um, are often given a choice um, within limits for the writing they are doing and we are encouraging greater audience um, with respect to, to the writing that they're doing so that they can develop their own voice and see that different voices are necessary for different purposes in their writing. With respect to instruction, um, the, the writing process is being used across the, the K-12 continuum in ELA classes. We noted that there's different definitions of what that means to teachers um, as we move through the, the K-12 continuum. Uh, with respect to time spent on writing, our 612 teachers believe that they have an adequate amount of time to spend on writing, um, given the balance between reading, writing, listening, and speaking that's part of uh, the ELA experience. At the K-5 level, they felt they didn't have an adequate amount of time. And when we did the survey, we discovered that students are, are spending anywhere from 15 to 90 minutes per six-day cycle on writing, um, depending on what classroom the, the students are in. With respect to choice and autonomy, um, we're working on giving, as I said, giving students more choice in what they're writing and um, giving them the, the opportunity to decide what genre of writing they might like to communicate their ideas in. Um, with respect to the, the focus on the reading writing con connection that is part of instruction, we didn't really um, go after that in the survey that we did with the teachers um, because of the focus on, on, on the other aspect of, of the, the uh, vision that we were looking for information from the teachers on. The recommendations we have um, are many but overlapping, I might say. At the K-5 level, most importantly, we believe that students need to have daily opportunities to write. And we really would encourage um, the district, and we know work is already being done, to look at um, creating a uh, structure and time and schedules so that students might be able to have that time. In addition, we're looking for students to have um, common expectations related to the quality of their writing so that they have a, a common language to talk about writing, but also that the teachers have a common language to talk about writing, so that as students move through the grade levels from one grade to the next, the way we talk about writing doesn't change from one grade level to the next grade level and that it's consistent within grade levels. Um, at the K-2 level, and I believe um, Deanna you know, talked about this a little bit in her recommendations, is the notion of, of looking at whether we move to the notion of having um, common units of study, because right now we have different <laughs> expectations for what um, the, the performance standard for a narrative piece might look at look like across the different classrooms um, at the first and second, second grade levels. And more consistency there would be, um, would support our students as learners. At the 612 level, uh, we thought that 
we'd like to work towards a greater balance between writing in the academic areas and for example writing essays versus writing for authentic purposes and again that supports the notion of giving students voice um, because they're writing for an, an authentic audience and also um, that we encourage um, you know the development of students writing across a, a content areas so that those teachers who are teaching in disciplines where writing is not necessarily the focus feel that within you know realistic expectations they can support students writing um, you know using high quality uh, writing um, strategies and producing high quality writing in in those content areas finally um, k-12 we would like to encourage um, work across the grade levels on the development of ideas through the use of, of refining um, our understanding of what is the writing process where students are getting feedback on their writing. Um, because we found across the years in our common assessment work that our students do struggle um, with development of ideas, which is really, you know, that notion of how do we build ideas within and across paragraphs and how do we work towards um, developing control over that process and move away from the structures and scaffolds that we are um, we provide students with as they're learning the, the the process of writing to the notion of becoming independent and, and developing a, a sense of who they are as writers as they leave our um, k-12 program thank you all so really in conclusion and you know kind of thinking about next steps um, you've heard mentioned here a few times tonight this idea of common units and we've really put an awful lot of focus on that um, over the last few years not only developing rich units but making sure and that those are being taught by all students in a given grade level I and mean, then really working their way up from a congruency standpoint so that the skills are developing and so many of the recommendations tonight we can actively take and embed within that process so that as we move forward, we're going to see, um, as John mentioned, more rich, diverse text, or we'll see more instances of writing be embedded into the curriculum, as Julie said, for the purpose of improving the student achievement, not only for our subgroups, but for all of our students. So with that, I would just open it up to questions. Um, and thank you. Thank you again for, uh, for supporting the process. Fantastic. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you to all really uh, presenting tonight. And uh, I note that uh, two of our board members did serve on the committee this year in the group, uh, Julene and Andrea. Do either of you have anything to add uh, further? For me? So Andrea, I believe, is having trouble with her audio. Uh, she had texted me a couple of times on it. And uh, let's see if it works now. Let's see if hers. Go ahead, Andrea. Hello? Can you Go hear ahead. Me? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? No. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Great. Um, yes. So it was an amazing committee to sit on. There, it was chock full of really, really um, um, amazing teachers who put a ton of work into this. So, and I, I want to thank the all three of the leaders of those groups because you had a, a, a huge job ahead of you. I mean, we were big groups and 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 get, gathering all that information um, it, on top of it happening right at the, all of our final gathering was happened as we were closed down. So it was it was a challenge, but um, you know, it was eye opening for, on a lot of levels, but I, I, I want to say that the, the, the teachers that were involved in this really um, are e exceptionally um, committed to, to our students and, and to, to really giving them the best educational um, uh, uh, process in, in the ELA area. So, it, um, yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you. Well said, well said. It seemed like an insurmountable task in the fall. Yeah. So to see the finished product is really, really pretty impressive because so much work was done by so many people. So thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again to everybody. To those of you who presented this evening, Heather, uh, Deanna, and Julie with uh, Debbie. You know, I sat on this committee in the past when we've done it previously, and it is one of the most involved in detailed 
curricular evaluations that we do for all the reasons that you folks have articulated. But when you just read through the report that we had previously been given, you realize the detail that has to be broken down by grade level and, uh, and really deliberated by our professionals, you know, to, to really figure out, okay, what works, what doesn't work and how do we move forward? So thank you to everybody. We really appreciate it. And uh, this will feed continued work and continued planning as all the review processes should do. So thank you. We appreciate thank you. that. And thank you for uh, hanging in there with us this evening. Next up on our item, on our agenda, item number eight, Brighton Facilities Improvement Plan Update, listed as Lou. Uh, we have uh, in the agenda materials, there are two reports from our construction manager, Campus Construction, the Brighton Central School District Facilities Improvement Plan, April Progress Report, so that's the overall plan progress report, and the Council Rock Monthly Progress Report, also from April. So we, uh, we get those reports, we receive them. Does anybody have any, we don't need a further presentation on that. Um, I will make note for members of the public who are still hanging in there with us. Uh, construction work, we're trying to take full advantage of all of the ability to do construction work under the essential, non-essential, partial openings that are going on under our, the governor's orders. We have been working in all the buildings where it's safe to do so contractors and subcontractors under the direction of our people and our construction manager uh, are being very careful and very safe first before you know forging ahead with construction but we are planning for a full summer construction season and schedule to the extent that we can and do it safely so that is underway and ongoing and we'll continue to update uh, members of the public on that but for this evening unless anybody have any has any questions or further information that they might need from Lou, I will uh, take a motion to receive those two progress reports. So moved. Second. Moved by Andrea and seconded by Larry. Kim, would you call the roll, please? Andrea? Aye. Larry? Aye. Julene? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Athena? Aye. Mark. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we next move into principal reports. And uh, I, it, Kevin, one thing happened to me. I lost the shared screen and I'm not quite sure why. But so if you have somebody queued up, I can't see them. So who's going first? That's all right. You can pick anybody. They can share their screen. Each of the principals are ready, ready to do that. I choose no matter who I pick tonight. Go right ahead. Well, I'm going to start with Dr. Tom Hall in Brighton High School because I wait. Okay, let me just say for a moment, all four of our principals and their efforts to reach out to the community are fantastic. The videos, the singing, Dr. Hall has a little extra there with his extra, you know, cooking, playing the trumpet. Who knows what he's doing? Washing dogs. I mean, but so we... We appreciate all the effort that our four building leaders are making on a daily basis, seven days a week, to connect with families and kids. So I want to make sure I said that. And so we'll start with Dr. Hall this evening. Go ahead, Tom. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to present tonight. We've got this. As my Bitmoji says on top, we will get through this. Um, can you see the PowerPoint okay? Looks great. Okay, yes. okay great. Um, some of the highlights just going through with the virtual continuous learning that we've been doing, it's 60 days today since we started virtual learning. It's unbelievable. 60 days have gone by. Um, we continue to miss our kids so much. Uh, we will, we're continuing to emphasize Schoology, OneDrive, and Office 365 emails for students to check and to use. Um, we've actually, um, oops. Can I just do the presentation mode? Be easier. All right, you can still see it okay? Okay, um, so we've been doing several surveys. I mean, it's been 60 days. Uh, our counselors did a survey at the end of April and we just put out a survey to our students. So, you know, with about 50 days in, asking them for their feedback on uh, how the distance learning has been going. 
um, what's been great about it, what's working, what isn't working. And we're gonna use that feedback to plan for our summer school program, uh, regardless if it's um, remote learning plus in-school learning or if it's all remote learning, but we will be preparing ourselves for that. And we'll also use it for fall planning um, that will, you know, Dr. Baker, Dr. Wiener and, and the principals will be getting ready for the summer work that we're gonna be doing. Uh, we're gonna use that feedback from students. It's really important. The district will be sending out a K-12 parent and faculty survey and uh, our counselors actually started. This is what I referred to before. Our counselors put out a survey in April, and I know the middle school is doing this now, to all of our students um, just after um, or during and after the April break. And we got the results on April 20th. We had almost 400 students respond. Um, of those 400 students, or 388, 19 said they'd like a personal call from their counselor. And the questions, I'll share with you the data real quick. Keeping up with your schoolwork, how many are? Uh, about 75% or so said agree to strongly agree keeping up with their work, 12% neutral, and then we had about 13% who disagree with that. How many of you have been contact, uh, in contact with your teachers regularly? Um, again, about 70% who agreed to strongly agree, about 10% who disagreed or strongly disagreed. Your sleep habits, what's happening there? And it went from excellent to very poor. Uh, you know, 24% said their sleep patterns are just poor. I think everybody's out of whack. Um, when we delivered the senior signs, we found, you know, at different houses, people up, people sleeping, and, you know, depending on the day, the time of day. I think everybody's sleep patterns are certainly out of whack. And it'll be interesting to compare when the counselors do a similar survey again uh, mid-May to see how it corresponds to where they were in April. Um, but kind of low in terms of the sleep end and how people are feeling about how much sleep they're getting. About 60% of our kids in terms of just overall, how do you feel? 60% of our kids about said, um, I'm doing great or I'm doing good. Uh, 30% almost said we're just doing okay. And then about 11% kind of struggling or having a hard time. And so we'll, we'll do those surveys again with our students. The counselors reached out to all of those 19 students. And of course, we've been talking to numerous kids and families throughout this uh, closure uh, due to the pandemic since school let out. And that list has grown you know, since uh, March 13th, the day that we left. So, but we're working on it. I just wanna give a huge kudos to our counseling and mental health staff. They've done an incredible job um, holding group um, and counseling groups and individual counseling via Zoom. Uh, it's just amazing what they've done. I do wanna give a big shout out to our PTSA for sponsoring our class of 2020 lawn signs. You can see a couple of those, one in one yard and then the other one, the parent decorated after the fact and sent me that picture. So they, they uh, made it even better than just the regular sign. So we just wanna thank PTSA for sending that um, ability to deliver these signs and uh, all of our administrators and Jenny Vigiani, uh, Dr. McGowan for helping deliver and Tom Hyman and Jose for driving our buses. Uh, it was it was a great day and you know we, we had a we had a good time. So what are we planning on for future activities as we continue to be closed and will be continue to be closed through the end of June? Our annual student award ceremony. All of you who are um, on the board and many of our parents know about our annual award ceremony. Usually it's on a Friday, first Friday of June. Parents come, we have the whole student body show up and we present awards to mostly juniors and seniors. Well, we can't do that this year. So we are, we're going to a YouTube video. Uh, Mr. Como and I will pre-tape that and we'll send out the link to the video at 6.30 p.m. on June 4th so that families can enjoy. All the students and families have been notified that they will be receiving an award. They just don't know which one yet. And on, so part of that award ceremony, so they're not just looking at me or Mr. Como, we will have about 80 slides for every kid who's getting an award. It'll have their picture, their name, their grade, the uh, brief description of the award, and then if they're a senior, what they plan on doing for next year. 
So we plan on doing that and sending out the link to everybody to honor those students. Other contingency plans that we have based on health guidelines that we'll have at the time uh, are, which would have been our junior prom, but it'll be the class of 2021 senior prom. So they'll have two proms next year. We'll be scheduled for Saturday, October 3rd. Our senior ball, Friday, August 7th, and our bash and banquet for Saturday, August, um, I'm sorry, Friday, August 7th for the ball and Saturday, August 8th for the bash and banquet. Again, everything will be contingent upon the health guidelines at the time, but we are planning to have whatever activity we can do under the guidelines. And of course, graduation, probably the largest ceremony we have all year. We're planning for Sunday, August 9th. Uh, we've come up with several different plans, talked to the superintendent today about those, and uh, we'll be sending out a thought exchange to parents and students just to get their take on a couple of the ideas that we have. It most likely it will be on the BHS turf field and it will, again, depend all on the social distancing guidelines that we have and the health department recommendations, but we are planning for a live ceremony of some kind, not a virtual ceremony. It'll be live of some kind on August 9th, uh, this coming summer. Other activities we're doing with the seniors. Uh, again, we replaced the, the yard signs. We reschedule our ball and banquet. We have a virtual college work military gap year decision day uh, slideshow that Eric Gruner is putting together for us that will be released um, just before Memorial Day weekend. Really excited about that. We have a virtual then and now slideshow that faculty did as well as our seniors to show what they look like when they were graduating from high school and our students will be showing what they look like now and what they look like when they first started school. So that's going to be fun. We scheduled weekly Zoom meetings with our entire, um, all of our grade levels and the senior class. That happens about every two weeks. Our Hall of Fame, uh, the Alumni Association is also taking part and they're getting all of the Alumni Hall of Fame winners that are available. We'll be sending positive messages to the class of 2020 and that'll be put together as a video montage as well. One of the big events uh, that we'll be planning for early June, probably the first week of June is a yearbook cap and gown distribution at the school. It's kind of a celebration day with all of our seniors and parents coming through the school lot and we'll have a lot of exciting uh, surprises in the mix for them when they come through the school. The date to be determined, but most likely the first week of June, we just have to get the yearbooks in. And yes, there will be a yearbook. So our construction projects, right now the auditorium and the science rooms, I didn't get an updated picture there, but certainly the outside signboard we could. So if you look at the picture to the left, um, there's the big gray box that was placed at the last board meeting I shared with you. And since that time, the actual transformer, which is that darker green box, I believe it's green, I'm colorblind, maybe Rob Thomas can tell us. Um, that box is the actual transformer and that will be able to be hooked up to the building, hopefully in June. So we don't have to take out power in July if we are running summer school at the school. The BSAA sign is continuing to be developed. It's gonna be absolutely incredible. Um, this is again, is a rendering of what it's gonna look like. Moving forward, please continue to check Hall's Corner. Uh, check your email, school G on a daily basis for our students. Practice safe physical distancing and everything that entails. Um, that will be in place throughout the summer, regardless of what we do. Um, and we just want people to do that. And AP exams, you know, they're making history. They started uh, Monday and they'll continue all the way through next Friday, right before Memorial Day weekend. Um, they're all being offered online to our AP students, 45 minute tests, all online. And there's been some hiccups with submissions of exams, but for the most part, it's been working and we're trying to console our kids who had some issues with some of the technology, but uh, for the most part, it is working. Um, a lot of town halls with the grade levels coming up um, that we are doing this week, a PTSA meeting for all of our parents on May 13th, and then the decision day video coming out probably on the 18th or the 22nd. Any questions? Thank you again, Tom, for the update and for you know all of the effort. Be we'll see this in all four buildings, but especially we're especially sensitive and supportive of our high school and our, our seniors, especially in this class of 2020, which is, as we've talked about, many of us they are uniquely positioned in history, 
and one day they will look back on it and enjoy greatly telling children and grandchildren, oh, that's nothing you should have seen my senior year. But um, the effort made by you and your leadership and all of our folks to make this a special end of year and a celebration marking their year in as many ways as possible, not the same as always, but elements of the same, different and special. And so thank you so much for that continuing effort. Right, thanks, Mark. All right, next we'll hear from uh, Rob Thomas in 12 Quarters Middle School update. Thanks, Mark. Good to see everybody tonight. I can't imagine that when we started the year, we'd ever think we'd finish this way, but we're doing the best we can, and we're, uh, uh, I want to update you on what's going on at the middle school. We've, uh, we asked the kids, what do they need to do, or what could they advise their friends and peers to do to help them do better in the situation that we're in? And these comments, along with about 30 others, uh, they came up with, and I sent out via e-news this this past week, but finding something to reward yourself, find the right, right place to do your work and more uh, great ideas right from the kids, I thought were a, a great way to start off our e-news and tonight's presentation. They have great ideas. Uh, students also are finding ways to, uh, other than schoolwork, to survive the quarantine and with some very creative ideas, which really help the mental health as well. Needlepoint, uh, dragons outlined in the gardens made out of stones, uh, one fella collected some toilet paper early on in the quarantine and he's displaying it in the doorway for his family to see. Uh, breakfast muffins, beautiful artwork, and of course students are finding ways to connect with each other outside of classes as well. And that's great and it really helps their mental health at this tough time. Uh, like the other buildings, we're well underway with construction, um, getting taking advantage of everyone's absence. The library has been cleaned out and getting ready for some exciting renovations there. And the cafeteria floor is being redone uh, while we're all away and we can't wait to get back and enjoy the new setting. Tomorrow night, uh, Mike Molloy, uh, Sarah Jacob and I will be presenting to our fifth grade parents and students about what it will be like coming back to the middle school in the fall as sixth graders. Uh, it's a 20 minute Zoom orientation live, we'll tape it so if they can't log on, or uh, they have any technical difficulties, it will be recorded and pushed back out the following day on Thursday. So if you're a fifth grade parent listening tonight, please join us if you can. Uh, a lot of students especially have been asking about locker clean out and getting their items back to school. All the principals are making a plan, a safe plan that follows the most current guidelines and we will be letting everybody know what that is probably going to be later mid-June uh, for the secondary level and we'll be collecting things and getting items back to you as well. So stay tuned for that. Don't worry, we will get your things back to you. Uh, one of the special events we're planning for the eighth grade is a uh, farewell party. Unlike any before, students are going to be going through the uh, parking lot with their families in cars, the teachers will perform a gauntlet, will hand out mementos of their experience at the middle school and have a nice little kind of a reverse parade for the students. We also just figured out today that we're gonna, or I'm sorry, late uh, Monday, that we're gonna have a talent show, virtual talent show, not only for students, but also for the faculty. So that'll be a lot of fun to watch uh, in a future YouTube video on our website. Uh, other reminders, please check the preliminary course selections if you haven't already. Once those are set uh, this week, we will not be able to make course changes because we're very tight on scheduling and staffing and we've got to make sure that input that we have is accurate. So please reach out to us if you haven't already to confirm those course selections. We've had two days of medicine pickup. Uh, we have one more uh, time tomorrow from three to six. So if you have any medicine for your children in the health office, please swing by the middle school tomorrow, three to six. If that doesn't work out, just let us know and we'll arrange another way to get that to you. If you need help with technology, keep checking the e-news and the, and the notes from Dr. Leaner so that you know how to get help with your devices. Uh, Dr. Malloy, Mrs. Jacob and I continue to meet with eighth graders on a regular basis. And that's one of the highlights of our week to see how the kids are doing and to check in with them. Uh, if you haven't already, please send back your student surveys. 
Uh, we want to know how you're doing and we, so that we can help uh, find ways to improve the work that our teachers are doing and that all of us are, are doing this, uh, this spring. Finally, I know the PTSA put this sign up for us, but I really like to thank the PTSA, the building chairs I have and the work that we're doing together and the added uh, stress and work that families are doing to support kids and teachers right now is really, really appreciated by all of our staff and our administrators. Thank you very much. And uh, keep, keep calling, emailing, texting if you have any questions. And are there any questions tonight? Thank you very much, Rob. We appreciate the update. And uh, I, I did see that banner that the PTSA put up. I didn't know about that. It looks fantastic at uh, 12 Corners. So thank you again to those folks. And just what a great message to everybody too. Uh, uh, thanks from everyone really for the continued support. So uh, French Road and Allison. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hope everyone's doing great tonight. We have some similar updates from French Road, but happy to report what's going on in our building. We definitely miss everybody in at the school, but happy to see everyone online connecting and it's always a joy to connect with kids online. Speaking of connections, lots of different ways we're looking at connecting with kids at French Road and families. Um, we've had some several opportunities for our kids to connect with other kids across the board. We've had um, started by Janice Mix, our health teacher, some Zoom meditations, which she's going to continue on twice a week for anyone in the building who wants to participate, staff, also students. And last week we had a great turnout to start that off. Our counselors did a coffee with counselors, bring your own coffee, and they had lots of families come to chat with them about anything that was on their mind. Um, that was really, that was last week and Marguerite Opet and Tara O'Brien led that. We've had some self-care Zooms for kids. We have families helping families, families at French Road who have volunteered their support for other families as needed around things like Zoom and Seesaw and getting schedules set up for kids at home and all sorts of things. So really appreciative of that. Um, we even have ongoing help with um, academics with Mr. Duane. So lots of connections for kids throughout the school day beyond just their homeroom classroom. Our kids are continuing to grow and learn from home. Um, lots of different activities happening in each grade level, um, including things that would be going on in the classroom, but they're just going on now at home with some online learning. So here are some examples from third grade, but some of the work that we see going on here is just what they would be doing in the classroom as well. Fourth grade two, a few screenshots from Seesaw of the work happening. Um, lots of events, uh, typical curriculum type things, but also some things that get kids outside, like this science activity that I shared, just watching a video, going outside, doing activity, bringing it back to Seesaw and sharing what they found. So uh, trying to engage kids beyond just the screen. Fifth grade as well, ELA math, science, social studies across the board and keeping our kids and students connected beyond the classroom has been something that we've been really focusing on over the past few weeks not just the academic piece again which is really important and we kind of have are in a good place in phase two but really looking at kids who are receiving different types of services that are beyond the, the homeroom classroom and academic classroom so early morning reading program is up and running and that's been going great for kids we have our tree huggers up and running for our kids we have chorus Zooms happening for our kids. Again, they're optional, but we've had lots of kids connect with those and they've enjoyed that. And we have our instrumental music lessons happening across the board via Zoom. And today even I met with the student council over Zoom, which was great. And that is a picture of the student council. They are working hard to help prepare for our third grade orientation at the end of the month. So typically we tap into our student council to lead some tours and share some information about friends and they're still going to do that just via Zoom. So lots of great things happening even though we're not together in the school building. We also have construction going on at Fres, like the other buildings. These are a few pictures of our art and music rooms. So on the left here are the art rooms which are you know you can see that's actually the wall was removed between the art rooms right now as they're redoing um, the entire suite and some more pictures here as well. 
So um, hopefully more to share with that, but you know, going into the building um, this week, it's nice. It actually is nice to see all of the things that can get done when the kids aren't there, even though, you know, it's sad without the kids there, but it does give me a sense of relief not having the kids running through the hallways with all this going on at the moment. <laughs> We are doing a drive-by high maybe on Thursday this week, but we also have a rain date listed here for the 20th because I've been carefully watching the weather every maybe hour or two, hoping that the rain shifts off of Thursday this week into another day, but we're not sure. We'll kind of play it by ear. I'll share with Res families tomorrow and update on what we're doing. But um, it's a socially distant drive-through event. We, our faculty will be standing six feet apart. They'll be dressed to entertain our kids, really just to say hi, give them some love, show them how much we miss them. I know that this will bring our faculty members just as much joy as it will bring our kids. So we're really excited about this. I'll send out more communication tomorrow, whether it will be Thursday this week or the following Wednesday, the 20th, which is our rain date. So stay tuned for info about that. Just a great picture to send some love to our families and kids from me and Miss O'Neill. And upcoming events, again, our drive by high. We do have our third grade orientation. Mr. Tappan and I will do that together on May 21st, which is the day that's on the PTSA calendar at 6.30. We'll be sending out a Zoom invite when it gets a bit closer to that. Mr. Tappan will chat a little bit about our 203 transition to Front Road. And we tentatively have rescheduled our fifth grade picnic for September. And we will also be sending home more information this week about student belonging pickup and also medication pickup at French Road. So we have some plans in the works and we're happy to share those probably this week. Any questions? No, thank you so much. Uh, again, we appreciate it. And you know, it just strike me, every time we listen over the last two months to the principal's report out especially, that uh, when you hear someone say school is closed, there couldn't be a statement further from the truth, right? I mean, there's, there's more activity on an ongoing <laughs> basis than when the buildings are open in the normal way. So anyway, thank you so much, Allison. We appreciate yeah. it. And again, the reach out is just fantastic. And I know kids and families really appreciate it as we've gone on here. So uh, wrapping up things tonight with our reports, uh, Matt Tappan and French Road. Welcome, Matt. Council Rock, but that's okay. Well, it's Rock, confusing. Right. It's all right. It's late, Mr. Kakanovich. I, I know where you go. I know where you're. I can see the sign behind you. I know. Thank you. <laughs> good, or good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, let's see. So we continue as well as the other buildings to learn from home. And this is just a statistic that I get on Seesaw. If you know that K through five is really using Seesaw as our main um, you know, portal for learning. So in one week, so this is May 2nd through May 8th, um, 10,363 posts were added in those seven days. 6,357 comments. So that means the teachers commenting and giving feedback and providing, you know, a, a little guidance. 5,000 likes or over 5,000 likes and 1,300 visits by family members. So not just the kids, but other family members. So um, you know, this is just an example. It is certainly the tip of the iceberg because it's where the instruction begins, but there's so many other things like the other buildings have been saying um, about, you know, check-ins and uh, teachers going above and beyond to make sure kids are okay and families are okay. So I couldn't be prouder of the work that our staff at Council Rock and across the district, um, the work that we are doing to make sure that kids are engaged, kids are feeling our love, kids know um, you know, what they're doing, what the expectations are. So just a, an example of what that looks like from Council Rock. Um, so another exciting thing, can't get through a presentation without talking about habits of mind, but uh, Robin Ackerman, our, one of our second grade teachers and our habits of mind gurus, um, partnered with a local art uh, author named Robin Flanagan, not related to Carol Flanagan, but she is local and she has self uh, produced this book, M is for Mindful, and it's really quite impressive. It's beautiful, beautiful artwork and um, a beautiful ABC book. Um, she happened kind of perchance, she came upon this author, um, connected with her before we, you know, left for, um, you know, due to the pandemic. 
they connected several times and uh, she, the author actually came in and spoke to her class, made connections. Um, Robin is actually helping from an educator standpoint how to, um, you know, work with the book and kind of create almost a study guide that the author will be able to use. Um, and then uh, Robin was actually published on the Habits of Mind, International Habits of Mind uh, website, the Institute for Habits of Mind, um, using this book to teach the habits of mind through this picture book. Um, and as a little teaser, I'm not sure exactly where it's gonna go, but we've already started to be in talks about how we can expand this small experimental uh, use into a school-wide author visit um, possibly next year. So um, Robin was collaborating with Ms. Motskovichis and our librarian and to see where this might go. So stay tuned that this is, may not be the last time, but super proud of Robin for, um, for that getting published uh, on the site. So, so uh, Dr. Rio said that I would bring up. So we have started the second to third grade transition for French Road. Um, it's something that we talk about every year and uh, we are very proud of, you know, the expansion we've done over the years in our collaboration of trying to help students and families make that bridge from second grade to third grade. Um, it brings about great anxiety and, you know, nervousness, but um, we continue to tell people it's going to be great because you've got wonderful people at French Hope Road ready to welcome you with open arms. But we've had to do some shifting, um, like, like we all have. So, um, Dr. Rio still met with all of our second grade teachers to hear about all the students. So we had half hour slots that Dr. Rio and I ran via Zoom where each teacher came and spoke about the strengths and needs of every student. So Dr. Rio heard about every second grader. Um, and normally around this time, uh, I would invite Dr. Rio over to Council Rock to visit each second grade class. Mostly it's a pretty quick pop in just to show her face and see who she is so that they can make that connection. We are actually going to be um, creating a video together in the next week or so that we will then post on Seesaw to act as that. Um, so they will still get that interaction of who's Dr. Rio and a little introduction. It's a little bit like me passing the torch to her in terms of principal to principal. Um, and then uh, she mentioned that May 21st, uh, we will do a third grade orientation. I will attend uh, and speak a little bit, but mostly it will be Dr. Rio, her staff, and then more importantly, her students uh, sharing what that experience is like. So uh, again, 6.30, May 21st, it's the time that was originally on, um, on the calendar. So we will send a Zoom invite out for that as it gets closer. So like all the other buildings, we almost like we talked about this, um, we had a lot of construction that has continued and these aren't even the most up-to-date pictures. Um, but this, if you look at this, this is uh, the new courtyard that was created by the um, back extension. Uh, so they've put in sidewalks, um, they actually have all of the amphitheater in. They're about ready to put the shade structure in. Um, it is, it, it has trees now since this, and um, it's really starting to look like something. So it's very exciting to work. Again, much like Dr. Rio, very sad to not have our students and faculty there, but if we have to find a silver lining, the fact that we've been able to uh, continue and even accelerate some of the work, it's, it's much appreciated. So this actually is a view from one of the new classrooms. It's not the best view, but it's what I had. Um, so they are finishing that up, uh, finishing up the flooring in some of those new sections. And um, it's really exciting to actually start to look like a school again. Um, although on my next slide, some parts don't look like school yet. So um, this is exciting. In the left-hand side is our new uh, cooler that's already been installed into the uh, new cafeteria. This is our main hallway. They've taken advantage of the time, uh, something they were gonna do this summer or maybe even into the future, um, doing some pipes and heating and cooling, um, HVAC, and then these are on the right hand side doors where there were no doors. These are directly across from the gym and they used to be the back of the 
auditorium cafeteria well now the cafeteria this year but now the auditorium and there'll be little offices that are added in that hallway and they had to actually carve the doors out of those um, so all of that happens since we've been gone so it's really exciting um, to see it all coming together uh, you know while we're away so closing out the year, much like the other uh, buildings, we are trying to figure out how to provide that closure for some students. Um, so we also have some drive-by highs that we will uh, uh, stole from Dr. Rio, actually collaborated with her in terms of what that might look like. Um, and we're gonna try to combine the personal belonging pickup along with those drive-by highs. More information is gonna come out about that. We're trying to just figure out the logistics of getting 700 students through that. So it will probably be three different days uh, per grade level and give some time parameters for teachers so that everybody doesn't arrive at one time, but we will send more out. Medication pickup for us, we've sent out notification to those people who have medication still at Council Rock, and that is over the next couple of days. So um, if you have medication, uh, you should have the times and a personal email about that. And then we're also looking at doing, uh, we typically have a pretty large end of year celebration and assembly for students where second graders are honored and we give a little bit of, you know, just a closure to the year. We are looking to do those virtually in June. Um, so stay tuned for more information about that. Um, again, via Zoom, uh, but we've got some music planned with Mrs. Button. Um, I've got some stories planned, just uh, trying to provide that kind of period to the end of, of um, the year. So any questions? Anything for Matt? Again, thanks, Matt. And uh, Council Rock, I, you know, the challenges, uh, it's interesting, the challenges over there when we were an in-person building with construction, you know, I've given away to some advantages and seeing the work progressing is just phenomenal. And that courtyard, what a magnificent space that's going to be for students and teachers moving forward and family events. And you can see that being utilized for so many things in the long run. So thank you again and to everybody. Thank you for sharing and thank you for all that you're doing every single day to make this work in the best way possible. So we do appreciate that. Uh, moving through our report section tonight, um, we do have financial reports on the agenda and provided to us uh, from Lou and Dahlia and also Maureen in terms of the um, uh, student activity funds reports. So um, we have the executive summary budget status report dated tonight from Lou, the treasurer's report dated May 31st from Dahlia and Lou, and again, the uh, student activity fund report, which is a quarterly report that we get uh, that's for the uh, end of the quarter, March 31st, too. I do make note, and this is these materials are posted on the agenda. I do make note that Lou does make note in his, his financial report. It's a budget status report is really what it is, sort of an executive summary for those of you that haven't read them. This is dated March 31st, so a lot has happened since March 31st, but he's begun to make note, and we've begun to take notice of areas that uh, their surpluses are beginning to show um, in terms of areas that we haven't spent as much this year with buildings being closed. And we're paying attention to that, and we'll know a lot much, you know, much more about that in the next month and each month progressing. But the other thing is it also points out that uh, transportation savings in many ways will be mitigated by the fact that we will not get reimbursements in to the fullest extent from New York State either. So uh, at the end of the day, we'll have to continue to look at that. But, but again, thanks Lou for continuing to update us on, uh, you know, through that budget process and where we are uh, current year to date. So um, if there are no further questions from the group, may I have a motion please to receive uh, the financial reports as outlined? So moved. So moved. Second. Moved by uh, Marv and seconded by Julene. Kim, would you call the roll, please? Andrea? Aye. Larry? Aye. Julene? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Tina? Aye. Marv? Yes. Thank you, group. Uh, and I move through our, uh, our Board of Education, the uh, School Boards uh, Association reports, uh, obviously we've talked about this, uh, standing committees have not been meeting and a decision was made earlier on. School districts and school boards, so many things going on. 
that trying to run Zoom programming around information exchange and labor relations and legislative committee is pretty much counterproductive. So uh, the officers and Sherry Johnson, our executive director, decided not to do that. We are working on messaging around advocacy. Uh, a couple of things have been sent out and board presidents have begun Zooming. Uh, we're gonna Zoom every two weeks in a board president's virtual meeting. We had, a, we had a meeting last week that was very well attended, very productive. And so we decided we, it would be a good thing for all of us to get together every two weeks. And we can talk about last week, the election and the voting procedures and processes, how uh, online learning is going, what different districts are doing. So it was a great conversation of shared information amongst, amongst the board presidents. Uh, again, uh, BOCES, um, yep. again, not meeting, uh, virtually meeting, but uh, Marv, I don't know if you have anything to add or... Uh, we, we uh, Sora gave me a couple of uh, things. Go get um, some. Have her come and do a personal report. If yeah, you know. right. She's upstairs <laughs> reading. Don't okay. bother. <laughs> don't bother then. <laughs> um, component districts have passed our uh, BOCES budget, which was a flat increase. And they elected, and of course we helped elect uh, uh, three new members. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry, two new members. Uh, th I'm sorry, three members, two of whom are new. Uh, districts uh, do not want us to pull back on our $22 million capital project for which they get aid. The roof project is essential and the pool is almost done. September enrollment, um, O'Connor Academy is down. Um, and what does she got here? Oh, EM, EMCC is down, Creekside remains the same. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Marvin. Thanks to Sarah. We appreciate her updating us and we appreciate her service on our behalf. Um, we also have this traditionally other board member reports talking about our individual activities. Not quite sure there's anything that uh, does anybody have anything that they would like to add uh, as far as other board member reports tonight? I Mark, I, I just sort of bring up with regards to construction. Um, I hope people really understand the scope of the work that Lou is sort of working across all four schools. It's pretty spectacular when you, when you look at it for each school. But if you look back on it collectively, we meet every couple of Mondays to go through just a variety of things. I'd also bring up that, that piece because we get a lot of questions about what that uh, transformer is in front of the high school and uh, Tom did a great job of answering that question and give literally the behind the scenes view because you only get to see the front because it's fenced off right. uh, as something we're doing. Um, the other piece I just quickly say and this really hasn't been brought up a lot is we're using something called build, uh, BIM which is uh, building information modeling that'll help us be more efficient in the future with finding problems, fixing errors and things like that. So as we're opening up walls and doing things like that, a lot of that stuff is being loaded into software so we can more quickly find problems with anything and just update the records overall. As you well know, and with some of the items that we went to uh, the Capitol for, um, sometimes you open up a wall and you don't know what's there. And if you find asbestos, you have no choice but to uh, remediate it and take care of it. So a lot of work being done, all with the appropriate physical distancing. Um, but the magnitude when you put it all together is absolutely astounding. Just credit to Lou and that team, the buildings guys that work for him, just phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you for that update, Larry. You're absolutely right. Uh, and we appreciate your service on that uh, construction management committee. It's invaluable to us and your experience in your, your private sector work. Uh, bringing that to the play is just tremendous. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, Julian, did you have something? I just wanted to add that in addition to the meals that the district is providing every week, Brighton Food Cupboard is available for families who need assistance beyond just those meals. And that phone number is 2715355. Call and leave a message and someone will get back to you. Thank you. That's a fantastic reminder. And you know, a shout out to the community because through the recent drive for more donations to the food <coughs> food pantry uh, that was held at the JCC, uh, they, uh, they were inundated with, with contributions. And then also the mask giveaways from the county that folks may have seen. The first one was Saturday at Brighton Town Hall. There's another one tomorrow at Brighton Town Hall. And people are asked to voluntarily bring donations for the food cupboard. And they collected 
a, a quite an array again on Saturday, and I hope they would do that again tomorrow. Also. So we need they collected um, several thousand pounds of food um, with those drives all added together, and there was also a drive conducted by a group of nurses on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So the the support is most appreciated because the need is clearly there. Yeah. But we want people in the community to know that it's available if they need it as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. And that's it is needed and it's it's not going to go away, right? We know that's going to be for a while. So thank you, Julene. We appreciate that that also. Any other board members have anything they'd like to add? Uh, I just want to apologize for occasionally going off camera. I feel like I should be on camera for the whole meeting. But the um the shine of the virtual meeting has worn off for my three-year-old. <laughs> so I disappear. That's what I'm tending to. I think she's gone to bed. Crush it. Entirely fine. We, if we need you, we'll find you. We'll chase you down. Thanks. <laughs> Any other board members or anything they want to share? Well, we have a, a teacher center policy board meeting on Zoom this Thursday, and I think a final curriculum committee meeting on Friday. We do. That's great. We do have a curriculum committee wrap up. You're right this week, mm -hmm. also virtually. So thank you, Mark. We appreciate that reminder also. All right, then uh, we'll move on to our Brighton Teachers Association report. Nicole, I see her smiling face in her square. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll hit the highlights. Um, so you have the report. Hopefully there were quite a few links um, this time that you could click on. So the technology is nice for that. Um, from the Council Rock Library, um, Adele has been working with classes and making books um, for each, uh, each first grade classroom is zooming in with her, uh, not zooming, I'm sorry, she's pushing out a lesson that they are submitting and turning it into a class book. And the great thing about the book is that she can um, constantly update it. So as kids turn in their work, the book grows and they can access it and read it. Uh, it's really wonderful. And she posted an ex well, in the document I sent um, is a link to her books, which is really charming if you have a chance to check it out. Um, Mrs. Ackerman and Mrs. Rhodes, second grade, they have um, been combining their classes and writing concrete poems um, with their class at, as they're creating their poem as a class. Um, and again, they have an example that was linked there. Kristen Cooper sent in, and I see Sue Gasparino is on our meeting. She sent in a big shout out to Sue Gasparino, who's a community member, but has also been helping with Zumba lessons um, or Zumba videos that uh, she's sending out and the kids are participating in them. So a big thank, out, big thank you to our community member, for doing that for the last eight weeks. <laughs> so thank you. Um, they're also doing all sorts of workouts in gym, um, including uh, cardio drumming, which I'll have to check that one out. Uh, bike and pedestrian safety, which is perfect for now. There's, there's kids out everywhere. Um, so that's wonderful. Uh, 12 corners in the NL program. They have been connecting with previous students who have moved. Um, so again, one of the benefits of, of kind of where, where we are that they can connect with people this way that they wouldn't normally be able to. Um, they're Zooming this week with some friends in China, so they were excited about that. Um, Laura Lu's sixth grade ELA class has a Harry Potter school, Schoology page. Um, so she's really, uh, I think, making it fun for the kids to come in and participate. Um, so they have a virtual Minecraft tour of Hogwarts. Um, they are comparing and contrasting uh, myths and telling modern day, I'm sorry, modern day oral traditions and personal stories, stories with a Hogwarts theme. So that sounds really fun. At the high school, you'll see there's a link that the AIM um, staff made to send to students and uh, to let them know they were thinking about them. And the staff that participated, and I apologize for any mispronunciations of names, um, Kristen Howie, Julie Bianchi, Aaron Van Strom, Megan Gibbons, Kevin Pierce, Kristen Tanney, Jennifer Clare, Becky Wiggins, Jenna Legault, 
Patrick Bond, and then Mrs. Mosher's dog, Atticus. So they were pretty excited about having the, the dog participate. Um, and then the trapezoid kids are working on their online paper um, because the paper that they had um, to be able to publish, they could not publish. So they're working on getting that out and should have that out in the next week or so. And that's all I've got. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing uh, all the wonderful things that are still ongoing, even though it's uh, Next up, we have our PTSA report. Leslie, uh, welcome. Thanks, Mark. much, but um, the PTSA has been working on initiatives to honor our wonderful staff. As Rob already mentioned, we ordered a big thank you banner for teachers and staff, uh, which is now hanging in 12 corners. Uh, the PTSA at individual buildings have been doing things for Teacher Appreciation Week to show our gratitude for all they are doing. Efforts include making videos for um, the teachers and staff, writing notes, and thank yous shared in a digital card. Uh, we are looking into donating more money to either the Brighton Food Cupboard or the district directly. Open positions for the PTSA um, now are currently treasurer and vice president and will be voted on at the next central PTSA meeting. We will be helping spread the word about the district budget vote. Um, and all the building, buildings have had meetings with the principal with topics ranging from online learning to transition to another building to our new grading policy under this emergency remote learning. Look for e-news regarding upcoming PTSA Zoom meetings with the various schools, which will be ongoing till the end of the year. That's Wonderful. It. Uh, thank you, Leslie. And again, you know, we don't wanna forget PTSA. Thank you so much to the entire PTSA organization and all those who contribute time and talent and funds uh, because the group has been very active and has shifted from brick and mortar to virtual as well as anybody else has also. And thank you for financial support to everyone for so many things, including the, the, the signs and helping make that happen for high school seniors. But the sign at 12 Corners looks fantastic and really nice. And okay, all of the other efforts to continue to connect with parents at each building level, continue to hold virtual meetings with the principals, continue to work for the next year, and, and, and not just you know, so many things that everybody's talked about this evening could have been totally put on the shelf and frozen in time. And, you know, let's think about it again in September. And we know that we can't afford to do that at any of those things. So, again, thank you to the PTSA for continuing all of the efforts that we know that the Brain PTSA has long been known for. So, thank you. And we're so grateful, as you said before, for everything that everyone is doing in the district. It's really wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, Dr. McGowan, superintendent's report. I'm pretty sure you've probably heard enough from me tonight. <laughs> um, are you going to save it for your highly rated Wednesday afternoon Facebook Live event? Is that what it is? Sure. Apparently, I have uh, plenty of family to boost the ratings. But yes, <laughs> I, I would just say this. You know, if you think about everything that's been reported on tonight, there's been nearly two hours of presentation since the budget presentation finished. Very rarely do things go on two hours past when I have something to say. So <laughs> I couldn't be more proud though of the people that we work with and the work that is happening. And so in the midst of crisis, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of challenge, the work is still, it's just better than the rest. It's really incredible. It's great, great people doing great, great work and uh, servicing the community in every way they possibly can. So I thank them for that. And uh, I may be disappointed like I said, nearly two hours ago in the circumstance we're in and what that means, but uh, could, could never find a single bit of disappointment in the work that's being done. I'm so proud of that. So thanks for being support. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. And we'll keep moving on then. And uh, I, I knock on wood because you know you're not supposed to ever discuss length of a meeting until the meeting's over, but Larry, Larry I'm surprised. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, the horse is out of the barn. It's gone now. You're right, completely. 9:32 p.m. This so. is this unique, <laughs> unique evening, and where do we have to go anyway? So anyway, uh, <laughs> we have tonight first read on a new. Uh, well, it's a revised policy. So may we have a motion, please, for um, 
A motion to approve first read policy 7511 on immunization of students, and then we'll have a conversation. So moved. Second. second. Oh, moved, by, moved by Andrea and seconded by Lee. Karen. <laughs> Karen. Pick one. As, as, you, as board members, you've seen in, in our materials previous, this is a uh, revised amended policy on immunization of students. It's a rather short policy, but a number of changes were recommended um, to our policy to be consistent with regulations that have evolved and been uh, upgraded, if you will, by New York State over the past year or so. Most of our language was consistent with that but there were also some clarifications pointed out by our physician <laughs> policy service uh, with regard to the district's responsibilities when a child has been refused admission or continued attendance for a lack of acceptable evidence of immunization, immunity, or exemption. And this is, a, this is an issue that's important. And uh, I would say just offering that our, the revised, Hey Marv, could I ask you to mute your uh, mute your microphone for me? I would I would just uh, point out that if in reading the policy and anyone who would like to see it is online, uh, it's clear, concise, letter of the law, and and follows all current guidelines issued by uh, state education department, New York State, and the state health department. So, uh, Kevin, did you have anything you wanted to add to this uh, discussion? No, not at all. I think uh, it just puts us in a better place complying with what the state has required. Yep, and it's clear and concise. Uh, any board members have any further question or comment? And then just to remind those who may be listening uh, who, who aren't familiar, this is first read on the policy. It will continue to be open for review and come back at a later date for second read. At that point, if approved, becomes policy for the district. So, uh, Kim, would you call the roll, please, on first read? Yep, Andrea. Hi. Larry. Hi. Julene. Hi. Karen. Hi. Mark. Hi. Christina. Hi. Marv. Hi. Okay, thanks. Uh, another item of business, please. A motion, please, to approve two bids. We'll, we'll, I'll seek a motion to approve them both together. Okay. Two cooperative bids, one for fine paper products and one for music equipment and supplies for the upcoming year. So nope. moved. Moved by Second. Julene. Second. Seconded by Karen. Yeah. Uh, again, straightforward, we, we, like all Monroe County School Districts, uh, take advantage of competitive uh, group bidding through BOCES II and their cooperative program. And this covers uh, some uh, music equipment and supplies and paper for the upcoming year. Uh, Kim, would you call the roll, please? Andrea? Aye. La Larry? Aye. Julene? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Christina? Aye. Marv? Yes. Thank you. Um, next, please, a motion, please, to approve an extended transportation contract with first student. So moved. I'll move. Moved by Larry on that one and seconded by Marv. Uh, again, we have this. Uh, this is from Lou to Kevin and on to us, dated May 12th, and uh, again, posted on the website. And what we're doing is we're entering into agreement by approval of this this evening uh, to extend our contract, our current contract with uh, First Student, which is expiring in June 30th. And what this would do for us. Uh, it will, um, this extension will allow for the next three year period um, annual increases only to the extent that the consumer price increase, the price index as uh, allowed by New York State Education Department uh, will be honored. So it, it's, a, it's a savings uh, for us, it's, insure, it's surety, if you will, over the next three years in the transportation contract. And one of the things that we all know is the difficulty in transportation, the uncertainty over so many things, foremost of which is, it has, to be, has to do with drivers and the availability of drivers uh, and the increasing costs of employing bus drivers. So 
thank you, Lou, and thank you to First Student for working through this and providing us some uh, surety around costs that we can plan on. So does anyone have any further questions or comments, questions of Lou? Kim, would you call the roll then, please? Andrea? Aye. Larry? Aye. Julian? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Christina? Aye. R? Yes. Next up, please, a motion to approve the tentative agreement uh, between the district and the Brighton Educational Paraprofessionals Association. So moved. Second. Moved by Marv, seconded by Christina. Again, according to the memo uh, from Lou to Kevin and on to us, dated May 12th, uh, the district has reached a tentative agreement with the Brighton Educational Pro Paraprofessional Association on a rollover contract. Uh, and you have that information in front of you. Are there any further questions or comments uh, of Lou? Kim, would you please call the roll? And again, Lou, thank you for your work on that and working through that issue and getting that settled with the group. Andrea? Aye. Larry? Aye. Julene? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Christina? Aye. Marv? Yes. We're almost there, folks. A motion, please, for approval of three textbooks. Uh, as outlined, AP Environmental Science, 91 Global Studies, and 68 Family and Consumer Science. A motion, please. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Larry, seconded by Christina. And Andrea, if you want to put them both down. <laughs> um, uh, we have this material, we have the memo for, uh, dated May 8th from Debbie Baker, uh, and also the proposals for the three textbooks, as I uh, mentioned all of the committee material. Again, reminding folks that we do buy some textbooks, uh, not as many as we used to, and they all come with uh, online resources and they're not book books like they used to be. Um, they go through a pretty thorough and vigorous process. Each of these texts had three separate committees review current publications and determine which texts best suit our needs. We have a material, we've been able to go through that. Does anyone have anything further question wise that they'd like to ask Dr. Baker or have any comments on? Kim, call the roll, please. Andrea? Aye. Larry? Aye. Julene? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Christina? Aye. Mark? Yes. And final item of business, please, a motion to approve the consent agenda. So, so moved. So, Second. So moved by many, seconded by Christina. <laughs> you can pick one of them. Uh, all, uh, Kim, please call the roll on the consent agenda. Yep. Andrea? Aye. Larry? Aye. Julene? Aye. Karen? Aye. Mark? Aye. Christina? Aye. Marv? Yes. And finally, any other items of business for any members of the board that we... Uh, that you'd like to bring up? Dr. McGowan, anything further this evening? Uh, so a couple quick reminders. Tomorrow, Facebook Live Town Hall with Dr. McGowan, 3.30. That thought exchange is posted. There's a link on the website for folks that would like to join in. If you need additional ballots in your household, please email vote at bcsd.org to request those additional ballots. We next meet again on May 26th. Uh, that would be uh, two weeks from this evening. And that would also be a formal legally required budget hearing. And um, we thank everyone for their participation this evening. A motion please to adjourn. So moved. Move. Second. Move. Seconded by Andrea. Kim, please call the roll for the final time. Andrea. Aye. Larry. Aye. Julene. Aye. Karen. Aye. Mark. Aye. Christina. Aye. Marv. He's not an aye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good evening, and have a, stay safe and stay home. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. This has been a special presentation from the Brighton Central School District Board of Education.